Wow. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for taking time out of your Saturday. And thank you to all the online folks who are joining us today. So I'm Fred St. Gore. I'm the medical director of uh, the Norma Melkor Heart and Vascular Institute, which we affectionately call HVI. And I also am a long-term board member here at uh, Fogarty Innovation who have so kindly offered their space here for in this beautiful space. And make sure you take, take a look around uh, for what will hopefully be a fun and uh, interesting day or morning. I'm curious, first of all, how many of you have been to a heart forum before? Wow, set a high bar. How many have been to five or so? Anyone been to five? Yes, there are a couple of long timers. Well, thank you. Yeah, so we actually first did this heart form now 14 years ago, and we have subsequently done it 12 times, thank you COVID, we missed a couple. But, um, and over the course of that time, we've had a sort of an evolving format. And I am really excited about today, because today we are basically gonna do a series of four panels, four fireside chats, uh, and they will be chats and conversations, uh, which I want all of you to be involved with, which we will be highlighting um, just some very standard cardiovascular problems. But most importantly, we'll be focusing on sort of refining and helping you to refine your all's pathway towards heart health. Uh, we, of course, will be highlighting some of the really exemplary, superb care that we have here at uh, El Camino, and that, and that wouldn't be possible, honestly, without uh, the tremendous support we have from all the administration here at El Camino, from the incredible staff we have, and the incredible staff and physicians we have at the Heart and Vascular Institute, which is a really ex extraordinary uh, endeavor, which you all, by the end of the morning, have a, have a better sense of, because you'll meet a lot of the characters involved. But equally, if not most importantly, um, the reason this is such an exceptional place is you all. It's the community. It's the involvement of the community with El Camino Health. Uh, it's, it's, it's really spectacular, and we, we all appreciate it here. Um, so in that line, I would like to uh, introduce uh, my good friend and uh, my collaborator on a lot of mischief, uh, Lane Melkor. Now, I think most of you probably recognize that last name, Melkor. Um, it's really a, it's a exceptionally well-known name in this community, and for good reason, because uh, Lane's grandparents, Norma and Jack Melkor, I think you'd probably agree, were they're really the, the first parents of El Camino. <laughs> you know, I was, I was thinking of what I was going to say about my grandparents when I got up here, and, and one of the things I always love to talk about was uh, when my grandparents moved out west, um, after my grandfather finished his PhD, my, my grandmother was a nurse during World War II, and she immediately wanted to get involved in healthcare wherever she was moving to. And so she found El Camino and said, this is the place. And she was here when they built the building behind me, which is what I wanted to say, but I'm not sure it's there anymore. I think they, they No, we've had a great time watching it come down. <laughs> Peace it's a boy's dream. What? <laughs> And I, I think they had to take it down pretty slowly because it was built so long ago there were some materials in there we didn't want flying all over the place. But um, I, uh, I joined the foundation board about 13 years ago um, at the request of my grandmother and felt it was a true honor to, to follow my grandparents' footsteps and be a part of this community and this hospital. And over the years, I've gotten to see how much this hospital does for the community, but also how much the community does for this hospital. And this hospital wouldn't be what it is today without the support of everyone in the community. And that's what makes us really great. Um, also, uh, Fred said that they evolved the heart form format, which is true because this morning I, I had a script that I was supposed to go off of and he said, no, 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 we're gonna sit up there and talk. <laughs> so it says, I want you to, to, to give a, and it's, I think it's really, really appropriate yeah. that the Heart and Vascular Institute is named after your wonderful grandmother. Can you sort of put that in perspective? Because she's really a, she was a singular individual. 
She was, and she supported every part of this hospital, but I, I have to say that the number one reason that she was such a fan and, and Hart was her number one space here at the hospital was probably due to this guy right here, Fred, uh, including um, wanting to make a donation to the hospital and she was gonna make it no matter what, but she told Fred that she wouldn't do it unless he got up and sang a song at the golf tournament in front of 200 people, and sure enough, he did. I almost, I think you sang it twice. I don't know if they gave twice well, the money. Well, I, I rewrote it to, to the words, but it was really one of my um, rare moments of embarrassment, uh, serious embarrassment. I think the room emptied out quickly halfway through the song. But you know, Norma was, was always needling us, uh, and, and she had just such this warm joy, but she also really, really wanted us to do better, to always do better, and always to be sure that we provided just the very best care possible for the whole community. And I mean, I was, I, was, I was so impressed with her real dedication and commitment, both she and Jack, to that. Yeah, and, the, and I think it's important to remember that you can get great care at a lot of hospitals in the Bay Area. We are very lucky, but El Camino is unique in that they, we are patient focused here. And everyone, the nurses, the doctors, they care how you're doing, how you're feeling. They want to make sure that you're comfortable. So not only are you getting great patient-centered care, you're also getting the best technology, the newest advancements in, in heart health, in heart treatments. And I think that's, that's an incredibly unique situation that we have here at El Camino. Thank you. I think we're going to get the hook here. We could probably, Lane and I could talk all day with old stories, but... Um, they started our timer late. We can go on longer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but we'll let you guys get to the main event. So with that, I'd like to introduce the executive director of the Norma Melkor Heart and Vascular Institute, Josh Schreckengoss. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lane and uh, Dr. St. Gore. I want to thank the Melcor family and our foundation uh, members that are with us, uh, members of the board, and the entire El Camino community. I want to thank you for being here. Welcome to the 12th Annual Heart Forum. It's sponsored by Norma Melcor's Heart and Vascular Institute, and we have a huge thanks again to Fogarty Innovation for letting us be uh, their guests here in this beautiful space. We are just thrilled to be back in Heart Forum. You know, for three years of the pandemic, we were only able to have the forum once, and it was virtually, if you remember. In providing this community resource, our intention is to try to increase the heart health literacy of the population here in our community. And we are thankful that you are with us, and we're pleased to announce that we had over a thousand people register for today's event. We have what I'm calling the live in-studio audience, I feel like, and we have hundreds more uh, piping in uh, over the internet right now. Our agenda today, we are is keeping it simple. We are going to have four panels talking about four cardiac paths of care. All of our participants work together in this unique environment that is El Camino Health. Community hospitals are not usually known for groundbreaking research or the development of new technologies, but our team serves Silicon Valley. And so the, the innovation and the constant improvement that is here has infused our culture here at El Camino. Together, we advance cardiology through innovation and the careful application of knowledge. And all of this leads us to what matters most, the best outcomes for our patients, period. This is what drives us. This is why we get up every morning. And the results of what we have uh, really helps us to see that we're on to something good. In comparison with our peers nationwide, we have the best cardiac surgery. We have the highest rating, three stars, you can't get higher our heart attack care. We've won the Platinum Award five years in a row. No one else has done that in the Bay Area. And we were the first in California to have the transcatheter certification. And we just got renewed uh, this week, actually. All of this takes a team. Not one person can do that. And so I'd like to take a few moments to showcase the team that we have here at El Camino that advance it. If we can go to the next one. Uh, it starts with our phenomenal physician leadership. We are so blessed to have such a group 
of dedicated and skilled caring physicians leading our cardiovascular programs to, to advance care continually. Working closely with them is the Heart and Vascular Institute. This team is comprised of advanced practice nurses, clinical data specialists, and admin support that work with the doctors and to lead our programs. In the work, we have our friends in the cath lab and perioperative uh, areas. They, this, these teams that perform the cutting edge procedures and surgeries with our doctors. And then before, during, and after these amazing procedures, we have our magnet designated world-class cardiovascular nursing teams. Then following the care in the hospital, we have the superb cardiovascular um, uh, rehabilitation services at the Wellness Center. In addition, in the outpatient front, we have our clinics. We have our women's heart clinic. We have our cardiovascular diagnostic teams. And the team goes beyond these walls. Today, we are joined by some of our innovation partners. And we are so grateful for the innovation and the advancements that they are bringing to care. And then finally, the team would not be complete without our El Camino Health programs and community health partners. What a team we have here. And so that brings us to the theme of our event, finding your way to heart health. Life is like a path or a trail that we all travel on, isn't it true? And life can run smoothly like a straightforward trail. Uh, that's what we like. But isn't it true that at times life presents twists and turns? And when we face a challenging trail, we may need to use a map, bring a compass, or bring along an, an experienced guide. Well, when it comes to heart health issues, these are complex matters, and they can lead to confusion uh, and make people feel overwhelmed. And what we want to tell you is that you don't need to face this alone. We are here. We, are like, we like to view ourselves like an experienced hiker, and we're here to join you on your path to help you and your loved ones make sense of what's going on with your heart health concern, and then to try to help you to find your way to the best heart health that you can have. So to do that, today we are going to take you along four of the most common heart health paths, and those are listed here. Now, there's going to be a lot of heart talk, and so I figured we should get a, a Cardiology 101 video. Would that be helpful, maybe? Okay, so we can all, we can be all on the same level. So we got a one-minute video that's going to go over four heart systems that will help you then to understand all the other panels that we get into. So let's play the video. The arteries, muscle, conductive tissue, and valves of the heart work together to keep it beating normally. These four functional areas can be thought of as the plumbing, mechanical, electrical, and valve systems of the heart. Terms that are used to describe common heart problems within these systems include heart attack, heart failure, sudden cardiac arrest, and heart valve disease. Heart attack. The heart's coronary arteries supply blood to the heart muscle, keeping it alive and functional. A blockage in a coronary artery stops blood flow to the muscle, causing damage to the heart. Heart failure. Heart failure results when the heart muscle becomes unable to pump enough blood to the body. Sudden cardiac arrest. The heart's specialized conductive tissue is the electrical system that organizes the heartbeat. Electrical signals spread through the heart, causing the heart muscle to contract. Sudden cardiac arrest is an event caused by a problem with the heart's electrical system. Sudden cardiac arrest occurs when the heart suddenly stops beating. Heart valve disease. The heart's valve system keeps blood flowing in the right direction through the heart. The valves open to allow the blood to flow forward through the cardiac chambers and close to prevent the blood from flowing backwards. Diseased heart valves may cause blood to leak backward if they do not close properly, valve regurgitation. If the valves do not open well, blood will be obstructed from moving forward, valve stenosis. Okay, wonderful. So hopefully that was helpful and help you to look at those four systems of the heart because 
the four paths that we're going to go on with our four panels tie into those directly. And what our panelists are going to do is they're going to share real life scenarios that they face with uh, patients and how they help those patients. So it will help you kind of um, bring this to life. It's not just academic, it's real life situations. Before we get started in our first panel, we will um, just have some um, housekeeping issue here. We would like to talk to our virtual attendees and let you know that all of today's handouts are available on the little paper clip. There's an icon for you or on the right side of your screen. And there's also a box or a question icon for you to ask a question. And so we'll have some question and answer period with our panels. Uh, we'll also be uh, looking to produce a frequently asked question uh, release after the event. So let's go ahead and get started with our first panel, the, plum the plumbing system. Well, we can invite our panels, uh, panelists up. In the United States, someone has a heart attack every 40 seconds. Can you believe that? Every year, about 805,000 people in the United States have a heart attack. A heart attack is one of the most frequent reasons to go to the hospital and to the emergency room. In this case, immediate attention is needed to minimize the damage and to restore proper blood flow. On our panel today, uh, we first have a substitute, Dr. St. Gore is stepping in for uh, Valerie Jo. She couldn't be here today. We traded down. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, so we have our cardiologist who cover the emergency uh, room here and, and, and provide cardiac care at El Camino Health uh, we and their medical directors as well. Please let me introduce uh, Dr. Rabia Ahmad. Dr. Ahmad is a general cardiologist. She is the co-director of the Heart and Failure Program. And I'd also like to introduce Dr. Anthony Ia. Dr. Ia is an interventional cardiologist who specializes in coronary and structural heart procedures. And Dr. Fred St. Gore is the medical director of Heart and Vascular Institute and has been a cardiologist in our community for 32 years. So we look forward to their discussion of I started this in path. high school, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, Doogie Howser, right? Dr. Seriously? Doogie Howser, is that? 32. <laughs> Um, Josh, well, thanks, and thanks for the, I think, the great introduction. There's actually going to be a test on everything that Josh <laughs> said at the end, so I hope you all took notes, and uh, we're going to be uh, reinforcing it here as we talk through this. So, as I say, the way we're going to work here is uh, we're going to light a little fire here, so we have a fireside chat, and, uh, and then um, and I, as Valerie, will just, I'm going to present a little bit of a, a typical scenario of a patient, and then just turn it over to you guys to sort of talk through what, how you would deal with it and, and what you're thinking. And, I'll prompt you from time to time, but so the scenario is it's a very typical one where it's a 65 year old woman who has a history of mild hypertension, her cholesterol has been a little elevated and uh, there actually is a history in her family of, of some heart disease, but she's otherwise been pretty good, she's been pretty active and what she's noticed recently when she's been walking around and even when she walks the hills, she gets a funny sensation. Her sensation is sort of a tightness up in her throat and also in her left shoulder and arm a little bit, but Nothing more than that, um, and it would always go away when she'd stop, and this was going on for a couple of weeks. And then she woke up one morning, and she was sitting at the breakfast table, and that same sensation while she was at rest came on. And it was quite severe, and this time it was associated with a little sweatiness, and she was short of breath. And it, 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 it did sort of, it abated a bit, but she just turned to her husband and said, I need to go to the hospital. So what would you be thinking when this patient rolls into the emergency room and, and you were called to take a look at her? So my first thought about this patient is that it sounds like she may be having a mild heart attack. Um, and what her symptoms sound like is that she probably has a blockage um, that is a result of plaque buildup in the arteries. And at rest, most of the time, she'd been OK because her heart was getting enough blood flow. As her heart sped up and she was exercising, her heart needed a little bit more blood flow. And that blockage was preventing her from getting enough flow to her heart muscle, which was resulting in some of her symptoms. That day, her symptoms became more unstable. The fact that they're occurring at rest makes me worry that there's something more critical going on and that something about that plaque has destabilized and that we need to do something sooner. So her coming to the emergency room is exactly what she should have done. And then what would you, as she came into the emergency room, what would be sort of your thought process and what might you, what sort of address in terms of your evaluation of her? 
So, you know, my first thought is, you know, her symptoms. Her symptoms are not typical of what we think about when it comes to heart disease, which, which in women is kind of classic. In, you know, over 50% of women who present to the emergency room don't have the classic chest pain. Sometimes it's what she described, you know, throat tightness, arm pain, nausea, sweating, abdominal pain, dizziness, lightheadedness, sort of vague symptoms that don't think it, we, are not the classic elephant on their chest, heaviness, tightness that, that people classically think about when it comes to coronary disease. So I'm thinking about her symptoms. I'm thinking about, you know, what are her risk factors? So for her, her, you know, risk factors, she has a family history, high blood pressure um, would be one question I ask, high cholesterol, diabetes. I look at the overall risk factors of that patient and women in particular. Um, I always like to ask about um, a, their history of their pregnancies. Do they have any complications such as eclampsia and preeclampsia, which we know increases the risk of coronary artery disease in women by over 50% in the future. So I always include that in my history of women in particular. Um, preeclampsia being? Preeclampsia being um, a complication that happens towards the end of pregnancy where the blood pressure goes up and there's certain abnormalities and we think it has to, do, it, it, it's a blood vessel issue with the placenta that kind of correlates with similar findings that happen with um, heart disease with the um, endothelium of the, of the blood vessels. So um, I'm thinking about her symptoms, and then I'm gathering a history. Um, her history sounds pretty typical, as we mentioned, of, of heart disease. And um, we, you know, the first test she would get is a EKG. Uh, the EKG, in some of these cases, is not always that diagnostic. It may be subtle changes. It may be completely normal because her symptoms had pretty much resolved by the point time, you know, if her symptoms had resolved by the time we saw her. So um, then we get some other diagnostic tests, usually a blood test or troponin, which is one of the cardiac enzymes that is elevated when people um, are having a heart event. Um, that Why is that? I mean, we hear the word troponin and, and at the heart. What does that really mean? Is it something that... Your blood pressure goes up. Your, what is troponin? So troponin is one of the cardiac enzymes that's released when the heart muscle is damaged in some way. So it, in heart attacks, classically, you know, when someone first comes in with symptoms, it may be completely normal. So what we do is we do serial enzymes and check them at two hours and then eight hours and look for a change, look for an increase, because it takes time for that to get elevated. But just because a troponin is elevated, it doesn't always mean that someone's having an active heart attack. It can be elevated in other medical conditions, such as kidney disease, or if someone's sick from something else, an infection, or, or has other... Um, other things going on. So it's not always, you know, the only tool we use, but it's one of the pieces that we use to put together a picture of what's going on with this patient. Um, the next, the other test we, we use would be sometimes an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart, looking at the heart muscle, which I know we're going to see some of these examples of um, in the future, and um, looking at what is there a part of the wall that's not moving that would suggest a loss of blood flow to the heart muscle in that area? So we put together these tests, and sometimes we include CT um, of the coronaries and stress tests if it's not totally clear what's going on with this patient. How, how good is an EKG? I know everyone walks in the door to the emergency room, and the first thing someone says, chest pressure or something. Boom, they get an EKG. How good is that for diagnosing a heart attack, and what are they looking at there? So with the EKG, they're looking at the electrical conduction to the heart, and there's certain characteristic findings we see in someone having an acute heart attack. If they have a total blockage and, and their artery is completely blocked, there's some classic findings that is kind of a slam dunk diagnosis in some cases. But in most cases, it may be more subtle. It may be just some subtle electrical changes. It may be completely normal. So it's not the only piece of information we use. It's one of the things in our toolbox. And when we look at an EKG, these, sort of these little bumps and things like that, what does that represent? I mean, is there, what are we looking at? <laughs> So an EKG is looking at the electrical signals of the heart, and it's looking at the different depolarizations of the heart as the heart's contracting. And so there's certain areas of the, of the EKG, which we'll see an example in, in, in this case coming up, um, but we'll see an example that shows what a heart attack is, and, and we see changes based on if someone is losing blood flow. And so there are classic sort of footprints for a heart attack versus other abnormalities? Exactly. Nice. So you did an EKG, and it's not totally diagnostic, but suggestive. What is, what, what's your next thought process? So I get the history, I get the blood work, I get an echocardiogram, and it seems pretty clear to me that this patient probably is having an acute MI based on their blood work and everything. 
And so we start medications. The first step we would do is start medications. Usually aspirin would be the first medication they get and some other form of blood thinner like heparin or Plavix um, is usually involved. And what that does is dissolve any plaque, um, any clot that may be around that plaque that's become unstable that's resulted in this patient suddenly having um, a loss of blood flow. So can you explain that? Um, so you're giving a blood thinner. I, I mean, I thought blocked arteries were just plaque filling up and just sticking it. Is what, what is what is the clot involvement with that? So basically, the plaque buildup is the etiology of the heart attack, the plaque based on high cholesterol and other factors in the blood vessel that leads to the narrowing. But what usually causes that plaque to suddenly become unstable and someone to develop a more um, severe uh, heart disease would be that rupture of that plaque. And when that plaque ruptures, something causes that plaque to become unstable. Usually it involves a blood clot around that plaque that results in that sudden you know, symptoms at rest and loss of blood flow. And so that's where the aspirin and the blood thinners come in. They help dissolve that plaque and stabilize that plaque. Interesting, good. So it's occluded, obviously if it's totally, and there's a, there's a pathognomonic sign there, it's that footprint for the heart attack mm -hmm. occurring. Um, what would be your next step at that point? So at that point, I'm calling my interventional partner over here, Dr. Ia, and I'm talking to the family and explaining to them that we probably need to do a coronary angiogram. And Can you explain that? Well, I mean, because uh, that's kind of a nerve-wracking thing when you're told you have to have an angiogram. That sounds yeah. kind of scary. So the angiogram, I usually let Dr. Ia go through all the details, but my assessment is you know, I tell the patient, you're gonna have a test where we insert a catheter to the vessels and we take pictures of the blood vessels and hopefully if we find a blockage, we can treat it with the stent as part of the same procedure. And I'll let Dr. Ia show okay, us. Okay, here comes the cowboy. He's coming flying in on his, on his stallion. He's been told someone's having a heart attack and you, you meet the patient either in the emergency room or maybe even in the cath lab. And what's, what's your initial quick conversation with the patient? Well, I let them know why I'm there and why we are doing the procedure in the first place. Usually we say your EKG has signs that you're having an emergency heart attack and time is of the essence. When time is of the essence, me and several other cath team members rush in. We get there as quickly as we can, usually within 30 minutes, and we tell them this is the procedure you're gonna have. We're gonna go into the arteries of the heart, we're gonna find where the blockage is, and if we can fix it with a stent, we're gonna fix it with a stent. Sometimes people ask us, how long is this going to take, Doc? I say usually about half an hour to an hour, depending on what we find. And they ask, well, what happens afterwards? And say, well, you probably will need some new medications to prevent this from happening again. And then they usually ask, well, how long will I have to be here? Generally about one to two days, depending on how quickly they heal. So you used a couple of terms. You used the term balloon. You used the term stent. You're fixing it with... Stand, what, what is the difference there and, and what are the implications and as a patient, should I be worried about one versus the other or know more about one than the other? I guess Great we're going to get it here. You can talk through this as we're doing it. So this is a picture where a catheter or plastic tubing is pointed into the artery of the heart. There is highlighted a blockage or a narrowing and through that narrowing, a wire will be fed through under the guidance of continuous x-ray so we can see it. This balloon here expands where the blockage is. Blood can now flow normally and feed the muscle of the heart. And then to keep this blockage from reoccluding or having tears, we put in a stent. This stent is made of metal, it's coated with medications, and this helps to scaffold that artery that was just opened up with a balloon. And so that procedure requires a little bit of contrast. So we talk about the implications of what that can do to your kidneys. We try to use as little as possible. And we would enter with the smallest needle possible, usually in the artery at the wrist or at the hip. And that allows us to do this procedure with as, as minimally invasive as possible. And if we're fortunate enough where there's only one artery that needs to be fixed, well, we typically fix that with a stent. But if we have other information, like someone is a diabetic or that their heart muscle is weak from multiple blockages, we have other discussions about treatments that may be longer lasting, like open heart surgery. I often say we don't know what we're gonna find until we get in there. Depending on 
the damage or the blockage. It may be like a tire, a flat tire that has one nail in the middle of the tire. Well, we can patch that up. The tire's as good as new. If there are five nails in that tire, you need a new tire. Are there any other questions that the patient should ask before they go off? Like, have you done this before? <laughs> <laughs> I usually tell them I watch a YouTube video before we get started. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> No, I, I want to I open up for some questions here, but uh, before we do, there's one thing to actually put in perspective for some of you here. This will they'll make more sense than others just because of your, your generation. But in, in 1955, when one President Eisenhower had his heart attack, he, uh, he was out on vacation. He ended up spending six weeks in the hospital and before going back to the White House. And his mortality, his chance of dying in 1955 was over 30 percent. When that happens today, what's the patient's chance of making it out alive, and how quickly do they get out of the hospital? More than 90 percent that they'll make it out alive, which is a dramatic improvement, closer to 95 to 98 percent. 98 is what I've heard. And they're yeah. getting home within one to two days, rather than put that in, in perspective. Hospital. That's in in all of your lifetime, most of yours in the room lifetime. That change is just remarkable. And it's kudos to amazing amount of innovation, amazing amount of work by people like these two here who really sort of set the standard for how this is taken care of. Now, this is supposed to be a conversation, so let's light the fire here. And do, does anyone have a question? Now, as you're thinking about your questions here, I'll take it. Um, as you think about your questions, if you could make them kind of general, don't have them specifically about your care, because if you do that, that's probably better just to go, go to your own doctor. But think of general questions would be, and then things that we could supplement. You had your hand up first, please. Yeah. You are correct. It would not, the stents are MRI compatible, correct. You, you turn on the MRI and they pull them out of your body. No. <laughs> you can have lots of stents and still have an MRI, thankfully. Yeah. Okay, yeah, please. I would, it, um, okay, uh, you got it. Uh, so they don't go through the groin, you know? The, is that not done anymore? That's a great question. Yeah, okay. So we prefer to go through the wrist more contemporarily because it's safer, it's easier to control uh, complications. We will often go through the groin if the artery in the arm is not the best suitable, either it's too small or the bends in the arteries. Uh, getting to the heart are incompatible. So yes, we can do both now. We tend to favor going through the wrist for safety. So I'd also, this is, we're talking to a big forum here. There's a bunch of people out there in inner space who are watching and I wanna thank them and acknowledge them and ask them to also send in questions because we have an all-star team and Kathleen, maybe could you um, transmit the question that you've heard? Sure. Um, so this is a good one. Uh, it is why do women present differently than men when they have a heart attack? Are their hearts different somehow? I don't know that their hearts are different, and I think that's something. They're, they're sweeter. Kinder. Come on, they're, they're much kinder. <laughs> yes, women are better people. Um, <laughs> so women, um, you know, just classically don't have those typical symptoms. It's just something about women's. Um, hearts that their sensations are slightly different. So sometimes women just have some fatigue, some lightheadedness, some you know nausea, some abdominal pain. So we don't exactly know why, but I think we have to be educated to know that, and in the past we may not have been so educated, um, that it's not, we have to just have a high level of awareness um, and that women's heart disease, women have the same heart disease as men. Um, it's the same process, it's the same, same thing, but we just have to be more aware of that their symptoms are different and that their risk factors may be a little bit different. So does a 50-year-old woman have the exact same risk profile as a 50-year-old man? I would say, you know, probably, yes. Um, family history plays a big role. Genetics plays a role. Women, you know, classically people think women are protected from heart disease. That protection we know goes away towards the end of menopause. Um, that within that time, the risk factor is that estrogen has some benefit to women in preventing heart disease in, in the time while they're menstruating. But post-menopause, women have exactly the same risk factors as men. Questions? Thank you, yes. This week, a, um, a history, um, a female, 85 years old, had a heart attack 10 years ago. It reoccurred about a, 
three weeks ago was uh, transported to Stanford. Helicopter came and picked her up. Stanford kept her for two weeks, and now she's at the Lodi Rehab Acute. And it was diagnosed as an aortic dissection, which I did not understand. Wow, that's, that's a good question, and that's a big question, a little different than what we're talking about. Do you want to briefly, though, just explain the difference? Yeah, an aorta dissection is actually the big blood vessel that leaves the heart. So it's not the blood vessels that nourish the heart. So that's not, um, that's not a blockage feeding the blood vessel to the heart. It's the blood vessel feeding the rest of the body from the heart. So that's a different uh, problem than a heart attack or someone that has a blocked artery that needs a stent. But sometimes the symptoms can be somewhat similar. So chest pain, back pain. So one of the things we always wanna rule out when someone comes in with chest pain before we necessarily go through an angiogram is whether they have an aortic dissection. Very good question. Question behind? Yeah, can you use a microphone? Yeah, sure. Hi, thank you very much for this. Uh, my name is Dhawal. I'm talking about, you showed that procedure of stenting. Um, is it possible, if there's some calcified plaque, which is heart plaque, is it possible to also clean? Because I thought there's some blades you can put in and do some, can you elaborate on that part also, the cleaning part? Yeah, sometimes the plaque is not soft. It's calcified, it's almost rusted over. And so it's not so amenable to just a balloon modifying it. Sometimes they need further treatment before a balloon can expand it. In those cases, we have several tools all available here at El Camino. There are lasers that can actually help to break it up. There's actually like tiny drill bits that will wear down that plaque. There's even balloons that emit ultrasonic energy that will break the plaque, just like we use kidney stone uh, energy for. And so if a plaque has that hard, resistant calcification, we will need to pre-treat by wearing that calcium down before we can expand it with a balloon and then prop it open with a stent. That's a great question. Anything back there, Kathleen, from the, from the remote? So how long is the life of a stent? And how do you know if it's in perfect condition or not, say, after about eight years? Oh, that's a good question, and one we get often. So the life of the scent is as long as the life of the person. We expect it to be there the entire time. It doesn't wear down, it doesn't degrade, but a stent won't prevent a heart attack from happening. The same problem that required the stent to be there in the first place can happen again. And so that's why it's so important to take your medications, eat healthy, exercise, maintain a healthy body weight, stop smoking, and going to the prescribed rehab to help you recover from it. So the stent is there to treat the problem you had, but it's not going to prevent other problems from happening down the road. If it did, we'd be stenting everybody's arteries before they even had a problem, and I'd be very busy and happy. What causes the um, plaque to harden? Um, so the plaque is usually a result of cholesterol, um, so high cholesterol plays a big role in that, but that doesn't mean that everybody who has a heart attack or has plaque is, has high cholesterol. There are other factors that weigh in, which are genetics. Um, some people are just more prone to plaque buildup. Smoking um, contributes a lot, so people who smoke, we know, build up a lot of plaque in their arteries. And so we know that people have plaque. Just because you have plaque doesn't necessarily mean that you end up with a heart attack though. We do things called calcium scores, which we use as a risk stratification to say that you have some plaque in your arteries, how do we prevent that plaque from progressing? And usually we use medications to treat that and the biggest one is statins um, and controlling the cholesterol, quitting smoking, controlling blood pressure, controlling diabetes, all of those play a role in plaque buildup. And you know, just because someone has plaque doesn't mean they inevitably are gonna have a heart attack, but it's really a focus that we need to you know, get your risk factors under control and do everything we can to prevent that plaque from progressing to a heart attack. Right, and, and when we see calcium in the plaque, that means it's been there a long time. That's sort of the end stage of progression. If plaque starts as soft, it's very active, and then it's it, it fibrosis, and the final beyond fibrosis then is, is true calcium. So if there's calcium in the artery, it's probably been there a long time, and truth be told, we all have 
plaque in our arteries. We do. There's just a lot of things we can do to keep it from progressing to that point. Yes? So you briefly mentioned about diabetics and the stent. Can a stent be used on diabetics? It can, absolutely. And, you know, personally, my father has diabetes. And so I often think about him when people are having their procedures. What would he be going through? And diabetes doesn't preclude getting a stent. It's just that some patients, if they have multiple blockages, they will have a longer uh, treatment outcome or better outcomes with other treatments. Sometimes open heart surgery gives you a longer lasting um, treatment benefit and can sometimes prolong your life more than a stent could. What does the risk of being a diabetic have? W wonderful. Yeah. So diabetes is a huge risk factor for heart disease to the point that we treat diabetes as actually a equivalent to having heart disease. So people who are diabetics, we want to control their cholesterol and keep it as low as possible the same way we do with people who've had previous heart disease. So we know it's a huge risk factor for heart disease. So part of that is just that the, the level of sugar or glucose in your blood is actually at a certain point becomes toxic becomes toxic to the lining of your vessel. It's called the endothelium. And when the endothelium needs to, to be normally function, and if there's circulating toxicities like glucose, that endothelium malfunctions, and that's when you start this prolonged and, and very dangerous process of plaque accumulation. Yeah, good question. Here's one. When you do a breakdown of heart uh, plaque, what are the risks of that plaque taking an excursion you don't want? Oh, great question. That happens about 1% of the time, which is why we are very conscientious of when it's worth taking that risk of complications like that. Thankfully, though, most of the time, the plaque will stay embedded in the wall and won't go down through uh, the rest of the artery. So that happens infrequently, thankfully. If that does happen, we have mitigation strategies, stronger medications to thin the blood so that it can continue passing through and to open up the blood vessel in the arteries. That, that's a great question and one that we get regularly because it's just amazing to think that you're putting balloons and stuff like that down these vessels and stuff doesn't get shattered everywhere. Kathleen, is there any sort of final question from the back? There was a question on statins, basically. Don't statins prevent the further buildup of plaque? And there was also one sort of related about the restenosis rates of the um, uh, stents themselves. So statins um, are probably our best tool that we have in preventing plaque buildup and treating coronary artery disease. So statins have two roles. One is lowering the cholesterol, which um, in turn, you know, lowers the risk of plaque buildup. So we really, when people have had heart disease, we want to keep the cholesterol as low as possible, um, and we have lower targets to keep it at bay. Um, the other thing statins do is they also cause plaque stabilization. So, you know, the plaque that we mentioned, unstable plaque is what causes a heart attack. We talked about blood thinners and aspirin in, in playing a role there. The statins themselves have a, have a plaque stabilization effect as well as an anti-inflammatory effect that helps prevent plaque progression and restenosis of stents or new blockage um, forming within arteries. So statins play a, a, a huge role and are our best tool and probably why our secondary prevention of heart disease is you know, so much better than it used to be um, because we really target that. If people don't tolerate statins, there are alternative medications that you know, we have that are you know, just as good and contribute as well. So it's not just statins, but we have a lot, a lot of medications to work for that. That's great, that's really helpful. So those are great questions, by the way, everyone. Um, we're, we're getting the hook here. We wanna move on to our next, but I hope this was a great start for the morning. You guys did a tremendous job. Anthony and, and Rabia, I think that you, I hope you all have a little more to think about and, and when you go to your doctor now, you have a little more information to work off of and ask important questions. So with that, thank you guys and I'm gonna turn it back over to Josh. Amazing, amazing questions. Uh, and just for the record, no one's being paid here to ask those questions. I'm just amazed how uh, wonderful this audience and uh, the audience online. Uh, so we covered the plumbing system, right? Now we're gonna move on to the electrical system with our second panel, electrophysiology. 
A cardiac electrophysiologist is a specialized cardiologist who focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of heart rhythm disorders. Their job involves performing diagnostic tests to assess the electrical activity of the heart and interpreting the results of these tests and then de designing treatment plans for the different arrhythmias. Uh, they may use a, a variety of treatments and devices and all kinds of things. Cardiac uh, electrophysiologists work closely with other healthcare professionals to provide a comprehensive care for patients. For this panel, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Garish Narayan, the Executive Director of the Cardiovascular Service Line of Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and Dr. Ilan Raphael, uh, an independent uh, cardiac specialist and cardiac electrophysiologist. And then we have with them our electrophysiology program um, leader, coordinator, Sean Merritt. Thank you, Josh. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to introduce our electrophysiology clinical scenario. So Mr. Singh is a 68-year-old man with a history of hypertension, and he has been experiencing palpitations and shortness of breath for some time. Um, initially, he ignored these symptoms because he felt like he was under a lot of stress, drinking too much coffee. But recently, the episodes of shortness of breath and palpitations have increased in frequency. So his friend suggested to him that he start using his Apple Watch to start tracking his heart rate, which he did. Um, but he was alarmed to discover that his heart rate was jumping up to the 150s, the 160s. So he scheduled an appointment with his primary care provider and received a referral to go see a cardiologist. The cardiologist placed a continuous cardiac monitor and this revealed episodes of atrial fibrillation. So after this, he received a referral to go get evaluated by an electrophysiologist. So um, Dr. Narayan, Dr. Raphael, what do you think about all this information uh, coming from wearables such as the Apple Watch? How many of you have an Apple Watch or know someone who has one? Yeah, so I mean, for those of you not in the room, about 80, 90% of people uh, use one. And um, these have really provided us with a very comprehensive, in-depth look at what's happening, you know, outside our offices, outside the hospitals. And, you know, especially in this case, it's been very useful in picking up uh, a very important problem. So I think these are very important devices. I think we'll see more of them. I think they'll be very embedded in how we practice in the future. I don't know. I would add to that, um, it's, it's, it's interesting because I'd say maybe half of the time, patients come to us with information from their Apple Watch, and a good amount of the time, we may actually suggest to a patient to procure or pick up a, an Apple Watch or some other device because they're so helpful in picking up these abnormal heart rhythms. Um, that's, that's really what they're geared for. They, they can give us a lot of information about your heart, but specifically about the heart rhythm. Um, so they're very useful, very powerful. They're FDA approved to do what they do, and, uh, and we use them. Yeah, and it's not only Apple. I mean, there are many different uh, forms of these uh, different variables, uh, different wearables that uh, we can use. Um, I think one important thing that we want to transition to is the actual condition that the uh, uh, watch identified, right? Uh, Sean, you mentioned a condition called atrial fibrillation. Very, very important uh, condition. Um, you know, in the U.S., about 4 million people will have AFib. It's responsible for close to 40% of strokes. 10% um, of people over 65 will have AFib. Uh, so it's a very important condition. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, so we are, we're heart rhythm specialists, and we deal with a lot of abnormal heart rhythms, which we call arrhythmia, and atrial fibrillation, this is a great example because it's the most common one that we deal with. Um, many of you in this room may actually have atrial fibrillation. It's a very important um, 
a very important problem, as Dr. Uh, Narayan mentioned, because it can cause a stroke. Um, sometimes it causes symptoms and sometimes it doesn't. In this example, this patient was having some symptoms of palpitations, which is an abnormal sensation of the heart beating. Um, and I think it's, it's worth discussing the different ways that we diagnose it, but also the different ways that we treat it. Yeah, and, and just as we kind of uh, talk about that, it's, it's probably important to delve into what atrial fibrillation really is. You know, that the heart is, I mean, we think a, a very beautiful, well-crafted organ that does this very intricate dance where electricity starts in one chamber, it stimulates the heart, moves nicely into another chamber, stimulates that. But if you have wiring in the heart that for some reason or the other has been blocked, short-circuited, displaced, these electrical patterns get very chaotic. And that can cause a very chaotic, irregular, very rapid rate. And sometimes this can cause very paroxysmal or intermittent symptoms. Sometimes it can be there all the time. Sometimes it can cause a lot of symptoms. Sometimes it can cause mild symptoms, as in our patient. Um, but the most important thing is obviously, like Dr. Raphael said, stroke uh, prevention, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I think the big important thing to talk about is, well, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with all of these symptoms that are really bothersome to someone, can lead to heart failure, quality of life issues? So, I don't know if you want to talk about yeah, a little bit about I, how we treat. Yeah, right. So, I, I think uh, when, when I talk to my patients, we discuss um, kind of a decision-making, uh, like branching, uh, a branching decision tree. Do we go down this route or, or do we go down this route? And the first one I usually say is, should we try to get you out of atrial fibrillation? Should we try to get you back into a normal heart rhythm? And I'm quite biased. My answer is usually yes, we should get you back into a normal heart rhythm. Although there are some uh, situations where we might say that, uh, that the risks and benefits might favor just letting you stay in atrial fibrillation. But more often we, we want to keep you back, uh, we want to keep you in a normal rhythm or get you back into a normal rhythm. Now, some patients are in atrial fibrillation all the time. 24-7, what we call persistent atrial fibrillation, and other people are in and out, in and out, and that's called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So if you're in atrial fibrillation, we want to think uh, and strategize about how to get you back into a normal heart rhythm. If you're not in atrial fibrillation at the moment, but you go in and you come back out and you go in and out and in and out, we want to figure out how to keep you in a normal rhythm, how to prevent the atrial fibrillation from coming back. And if we decide to go down that road, what we call rhythm control, controlling your heart rhythm, keeping you in a normal rhythm, we have two major strategies, which are medications and ablation. Yeah, so uh, ablation um, is an increasingly used uh, modality. You know, medications obviously have their role, and we want to be very thoughtful about which strategy we use for whom. Medications, of course, have their own side effects. Some drawbacks are that they don't last very long. You could be on medications and they may eventually fail. But in the right setting for the right person, they may be an excellent choice. We want to, however, highlight ablation because for the first time, really, uh, we have an opportunity to substantially modify the course of atrial fibrillation. And, you know, like a lot of technological advances over the last 10, 15 years, there have been so many that we can uh, now apply that we can actually get rid of atrial fibrillation for a long time. Yep. Um, maybe we can roll the video a little bit and uh, I can show you what we actually do. So before you start, um, this is kind of a... Uh, schematic of our heart chamber. You, you've all had the review session early morning, but the two top chambers are the atria, right? These, this is the location where the irregular heartbeat comes from. The one on the left side of the screen is the left atrium. That's primarily the source of the atrial fibrillation. And impulses from there sometimes can go rogue. 
okay? Instead of being under the normal control of the pacemaker of the heart, they can start firing independently very fast, and they can put the heart into a very irregular seizure-like rhythm. Um, so the goal of an ablation is actually to travel into the heart, right, with a, with a little tiny tube, a uh, little imaging equipment all through your groin, which you will see, and we go to that chamber, we make an electrical map of where things are, and we deliver very specific um, controlled burns or sometimes other modalities to destroy tissue to get rid of those uh, uh, areas. Atrial fibrillation is a heart arrhythmia in which abnormal electrical signals begin in the atria top chambers. Atrial fibrillation may be treated by ablation surgery if medications alone are not effective. In ablation, areas of tissue in the heart that cause arrhythmias are destroyed. A catheter is inserted into the heart via a blood vessel in the leg. A small needle is used to make two small holes to allow the passage of the catheters from the right side to the left side of the heart. Before the ablation, electrical mapping of the heart is performed. An electrically sensitive catheter is used to map the heart muscle and the origins of the electrical activity throughout the heart. The map tells the surgeon which areas of the heart are creating problematic electric signals that interfere with the proper rhythm. The interventionalist carefully destroys malfunctioning tissue using a catheter to deliver energy, such as radiofrequency or cryotherapy, to scar the problematic areas. The scarred areas will no longer send abnormal signals. Okay, so uh, pretty complex, pretty exciting, but surprisingly routine. Uh, we are we're very proud to do these procedures day in and day out on patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, you know, I, I would point out a couple things. This, this, you know, the field of cardiology, as has been mentioned today, has really evolved a lot over the last uh, couple decades. Uh, Again, uh, coming from a biased place, but I, I like to think that electrophysiology, the field of cardiac arrhythmia, has really um, taken the lead in the evolution. I, I find that you know, the way we practice electrophysiology today is almost unrecognizable from the way it was done 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and, and what I'm getting at is uh, ablation used to be uh, reserved for when nothing else is working. We've tried medications, we've tried shocking the heart uh, with those paddles from outside, um, and, and we're almost backs against the, the wall and, and, and we'll say, okay, we'll try the ablation. But things have really evolved. Uh, the, the, uh, the technology has evolved. Um, the success has really advanced. And the safety of these procedures has really, really improved. And putting that all together, uh, the ablation um, strategy has really moved and almost inverted from um, um, the order of recommendations. So as it used to be the last line approach, these days we're actually recommending it up front. Um, it even used to be that you have to try a medication first. And these days, in some patients, it may be appropriate to recommend an ablation up front. Um, some patients have a hard time with medications. Some patients have, uh, are very sensitive to side effects. Some patients are taking so many medications and we're worried that another medication may interact in a way that's just gonna be unfavorable. Um, more than that, uh, in some of the research studies that we have where we compare medications to ablations, ablation is more effective. So it's really becoming um, a, a more favorable uh, procedure or option, and um, it's, it's increasingly routine, but it's still very complex. So it's a very, very um, exciting but important and um, uh, valuable option that we can, we can discuss with our patients. Yeah, well, I, I think the second aspect of atrial fibrillation, like we hinted at before, um, is really stroke risk, right? And uh, oftentimes, uh, you'll hear about the use of uh, blood thinners. So, uh, Alan, I don't know if you want to comment a little bit about this patient right. and what, what we do to address that specific risk. Right. So we, we do 
we do compartmentalize the approach, uh, whether we do an ablation or whether we try medications, whether you're in AFib all the time or whether or not you're going back and forth, that's kind of one area of the management. The whole, there's a whole other side of, um, of the treatment approach, which is protecting you from having a stroke. And the most important thing that we can do for you is to protect you from having a stroke. And we do that by putting you on blood thinners. And that can be a relief to know that you're being protected, but also very daunting to know that you have to take blood thinners. That sounds scary for some patients. Um, but it's really been proven to be the most effective way to protect our patients from having a stroke. Um, so as a segue, well, what if, what if you can't safely take a blood thinner? What if you've had uh, internal bleeding? Uh, what if you've had blood in blood in the urine, blood in the stool, God forbid a blood uh, or a bleeding problem in the brain even. Uh, what if you are unsteady on your feet and, it's, uh, and you've fallen before and um, we're worried that if you fall and you're on a blood thinner, you could have a, a complicated bleeding problem. Uh, well, so, so what are our alternatives? What, what, how else can we protect you from having a stroke? Um, so what are our options? Well, you could stop taking a blood thinner, then you'll be safer from a bleeding perspective, but then you'll be vulnerable from a stroke perspective. So the other option um, is an innovation called Watchman device. Uh, and Watchman is just one kind of uh, these devices which are occluding the left atrium, or the left atrial appendage. If I could just point to the... Um, to the picture, what's not shown here is an appendage, like an appendix on your intestine. We all have, we're all born with these, um, uh, with, with an appendix. There's an appendix that's kind of sitting off here like an ear on the left atrium. Uh, we call it an appendage. And, and, w and when we talk about patients having strokes in atrial fibrillation, um, that happens because blood clots form inside the heart and then they, if we're, if we're unlucky, they can travel up to the brain and block a blood vessel that supplies the, the, the brain with blood. Well, in, according to our research, over 90% of those blood clots form in that appendage. So that's kind of our culprit spot. That's our, our target zone when we think about stroke. So if, you know, as a, as a tangent, if you if, or someone you know is going to have surgery, open heart surgery, and they have atrial fibrillation, say they're going to have surgery for a valve to be replaced or uh, uh, repaired, or they're going to have a bypass surgery, a surgeon uh, will clip that appendage off or uh, clip it closed or sew it shut just to protect patients with atrial fibrillation from having a stroke. Well, it may be a, a tall order to send you to open heart surgery to occlude your, um, your appendage. Uh, so this, this wonderful innovation that I mentioned called the Watchman device or, or some other kind of occlusion device can actually occlude that appendage uh, by inserting a catheter through the vein in the leg. And it's a wonderful innovation and a really terrific solution for patients who have atrial fibrillation and have a risk for stroke and need to be on a blood thinner but cannot safely take a blood thinner. So that's a, that's a really fantastic innovation uh, that we can offer our patients here in the community. Yeah, that's great. And, and you know, all the innovation doesn't necessarily happen through devices. Um, I, I think we would remember an era when blood thinners were very difficult to use, right? Uh, we used to use a, a blood thinner called warfarin where people would have to come in on a regular basis and some patients still have to take it. And there'd be a lot of interactions with medications. The level used to be have to uh, get adjusted on a frequent basis. And now actually for the past decade or so, we actually now have excellent medications that don't need to be monitored, that we take on a fixed dose that have a even better safety profile and probably efficacy or they're better at preventing strokes. So that's improved too. The medical therapy has improved, not to mention the actual uh, ability to technically occlude uh, the appendage and uh, uh, you know, obviate or prevent the need for taking a blood thinner. 
Uh, we could probably go on talking about atrial fibrillation management in this particular case for hours, but maybe we can open up uh, the discussion to questions. Yes, sir. risk of it reverting was in the high percentages. 60 or 70 percent of the first ablations were successful and not more than that. How is that today? That's a good question and I do point out this to all my patients. Um, unfortunately, ablation is not a cure for AFib. It is the closest thing we have to a cure, but it's not a cure. And as I mentioned, it, it's more effective than medications, and it really is something we want to keep on the table for options when we're trying to treat atrial fibrillation because it's so effective, but it's not a cure. Uh, the answer to that question uh, about how effective is it, how likely is it to come back, depends on a lot of factors. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there's a difference uh, between being in and out, in and out, versus in it all the time. Uh, if you're in it all the time, we call that persistent atrial fibrillation, and if you're in and out, in and out, we call that paroxysmal. Uh, the research has shown that if you are paroxysmal, in and out, and you go for an ablation, the success rate can be anywhere between 80 to 90 percent, and that's pretty good. That's about four out of five will stay in a normal rhythm for the foreseeable future. And um, if you are persistent, it's lower. It's around 60 to 70% um, ideally. Uh, and that means two thirds of patients will, will respond quite well, but about one out of three will have a recurrence, usually within a year. And then, uh, well, the good news is, all your options are still on the table. We can treat, you know, we don't, we, we can do another ablation. Uh, we can consider medications. So it's not like you only get one shot. Uh, one thing I think is an important tangent about this topic is that patients with atrial fibrillation, you know, atrial fibrillation, it starts paroxysmal typically, where it, it comes for an hour and then it goes away, and a week later it comes back. And with time it progresses, it advances, so that the episodes last longer in duration, and then they increase in frequency, and if it's not treated, it can progress to persistent atrial fibrillation. And this has an implication on how we treat it, so we want to be a little bit more aggressive earlier on and stay ahead of it, rather than chasing after it after the AFib has advanced. Yeah, I would agree. It's a very important point, um, and that's really influenced how we take care of patients today. If we catch this early, we have a much better success rate as opposed to waiting, trying medications, doing other things, which really affect how well things turn out. Um, the other thing I wanted to add are the importance of risk factors, right? So just like you saw in the prior panel, we can put in, they can put in a stent in a blocked coronary artery, but if you don't treat the cholesterol or you don't treat the diabetes, you're gonna get disease elsewhere. And similarly with atrial fibrillation, we might be able to get rid of areas of the heart that are triggering this, but if you don't manage risk factors, such as high blood pressure or other structural problems that are developing with the heart um, or weight, things like sleep apnea, atrial fibrillation will come back. And so we don't want to take care of the problem just at that moment in time. We want to affect and improve someone's outcome for a long, long time. So it's important to address all of those. What is, what is the um, difference between the ablation Sir, could we wait for the microphone? Um, we have virtually. Uh, he asked. He asked, well. "What's the difference yeah. between a regular ablation and what's called a maze ablation?" Maze. Uh, it was. It was a physician's name that um, that uh, the procedure was named after. Basically, the the big difference is one is an open heart surgery, where there's an incision made in the chest and the catheters and the the equipment is being applied on the outside of the heart. And uh, the kind of ablation that we do is all done through veins in the legs, through using catheters. What is the progression of VATS maze? VATS maze? 
Uh, I believe Vats Maze is done. It's a, it's a less aggressive uh, incision. It's not classic open heart surgery, but minimal, what's called minimal thoracotomies, uh, smaller incisions, typically on the side. They'll deflate a lung in order to uh, allow uh, more ease for inserting all the equipment. Uh, sometimes this is actually done in a hybrid approach with catheters through the veins in the leg, either on the same day or uh, a month or two later. Um, it's a much more aggressive approach. It's been requ it's requested that I take um, uh, you know uh, small aspirin every day, and I don't remember to do that quite. But I've not, not had any problems. I have one question: that uh, is there any correlation between stress and AFib? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, so. Uh, thank you. Uh, he said that he had an ablation nine years ago and um, was told that maybe after five years it could come back, uh, but thankfully everything's going quite smoothly. Uh, he was advised to take an aspirin, uh, which is not a bad idea. Uh, it, it just really depends on each individual patient, the recommendations about whether you should stay on blood thinners even nine years later or if it's okay to get away with an aspirin. Uh, but then, then you asked about stress. I am a very, very firm believer that stress has a huge impact on the heart rhythm, including atrial fibrillation. Um, there's a lot of data that's gone into this. There was a beautiful study called the yoga study where patients uh, were, were um, divided into two groups. One pre all of them had atrial fibrillation. One group did yoga, the other group didn't. And, and the group who did yoga had less atrial fibrillation. And, um, you know, sure, there may be something to the yoga, but I interpret it as a, a reduction in stress. Um, yeah, I would completely agree. I, I think uh, stress plays a very, very important role. Uh, the problem is, how do you quantify it? And, of course, how do you control it? And um, I, I think we also recognize that stress indirectly affects how we eat how we sleep, how much exercise we get. So there are a lot of uh, very complex interactions. But yes, if we, if we can handle our stress well, um, I mean, we can't remove sources of stress, but if we can handle it well, it will improve our cardiovascular outcomes, especially heart rhythm issues. So if we could just uh, check in on our virtual attendees. Are there any questions from our virtual community? is one that discusses, it's a technical question, but there were quite a few questions about the catheter holes that you're putting into the heart between the two atria, and how do they, how do they recover from that procedure? Yeah, so uh, interestingly, the heart heals. So if we look at um, pictures or echocardiograms of the heart, you know, nine to 12 months uh, later, about 80 to 90 percent of these holes are completely closed. Um, the remaining ones are extremely small. Okay, and typically don't um, present any clinical issues. Online, um, can I get off my anticoagulation after I have my ablation? It's a very common and very important uh, and excellent question. Uh, my answer is um, yes and no. Uh, it just depends. It depends on the patient. Um, there's a whole conversation we could have about uh, the chads VAS score, which is really important. It should be a part of every visit you have with your cardiologist if you have atrial fibrillation. Uh, that's an important factor. Uh, and, then the, and, then the, and then the other answer is, if yes, uh, how? Uh, there, there should be a monitoring place uh, or a monitoring strategy in place. And that may actually bring us full circle back to the Apple Watch. Um, uh, that's one very powerful and excellent technique or tool that we use or that I, I certainly use when the uh, question of coming off of blood thinners arises. Um, so, yeah. I'm sorry, you had a question in the middle. Or do, uh, do we have any, can we go back to the live audience? 
Um, are there any pacemakers? I have Brocardia, tachypyridia syndrome. I have a pacemaker in me for the Brocardia side, but I also hit AFib. I've had a stroke in the past. The AFib's been kicking up lately. Are there pacemakers that can address both sides of that in the heart, or is it you just have to do the pacemaker for the slow side and the medicine for the high side? I, I have they developed because it's been years since I've had my pacemaker put in? It's a yes and no uh, answer again. Primarily the pacemakers are, are designed to treat the bradycardia. There are advancements over the last few decades, there are algorithms that the pacemakers have that can actually get you out of atrial fibrillation, yes, but that's not really the primary um, design of the pacemaker, it's more like a perk. Uh, the, the, as, as you mentioned, um, well, indirectly pacemakers are very helpful for atrial fibrillation because they can allow us to have more confidence to treat you with medications, um, but, but directly the pacemaker doesn't really treat the atrial fibrillation except for those those innovative algorithms that sometimes can be very effective. Uh, from the electrophysiology point of view, again, thank you. Um, we hear sometimes of folks, even in their 50s or 60s, who suddenly get in some event and they just pass away, like sudden, like in few minutes. and. Sometimes the diagnosis is that it's some electric current got stopped or something. Can you please elaborate on those situations? Yeah, so this is a another very important area, completely different than atrial fibrillation, and it was alluded to at the beginning, which is sudden cardiac death, right? Um, and uh, basically what happens there is this the same electrical chaos that affects the top chamber of the heart has now affected this main pumping chamber of the heart, the left ventricle. And essentially what happens is there's a sudden onset of this irregular chaotic rhythm, and the heart essentially develops a seizure, stops pumping blood, someone collapses. And so unfortunately, it's a catastrophic event, right, most of the time. The causes of this are quite varied. They can be, you know, like, we heard before, sometimes it can be a heart attack, and that lack of blood supply can trigger this rhythm problem. Sometimes it could be a genetic predisposition to having this electrical issue. Sometimes, you know, it can be even a, a mechanical injury to the heart that can trigger this. So there are obviously ways that we could potentially predict this. Okay, unfortunately we can't predict actually the vast majority, but we can identify people who are at risk of this, right? So people who've had a significant heart attack whose heart is very weakened, or who've had a family history of this particular syndrome and they may carry a genetic defect that puts them at higher risk, right? To the extent we can screen for this, we have some options available, right? And so what are those options? So sometimes it's some medication but lots of times it's actually a, a device which, like a pacemaker, um, is, it's called a defibrillator. But the main goal of that is to con kind of constantly monitor you. It will, as an implanted device, it's constantly looking at your heart rhythm, heart rate. And if ever you develop this dangerous heart rhythm, it will detect it and deliver a shock to reset the heart back to normal. Okay. So unfortunately, our ability to predict who uh, and, and comprehensively know who's going to have this is very poor, but we can identify you know, a substantial number of people who can benefit from this. Uh, I just want to add one thing about the importance of CPR and chest compressions. Yep. Knowing how to do that uh, is really going to make the difference between being able to save somebody's life uh, and, and, and save their quality of life. Um, so it's it's you know it's 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 crucial. It's crucial that the community learns how um, to perform CPR effectively, and that's also a whole other conversation, a whole other Saturday morning. But uh, it's very important and very relevant. Yeah, great point. Yep. Very expensive, even with insurance. Do you have anything to say about that? That's another whole weekend discussion, <laughs> but 
Um, I don't know if you want to take this. Well, uh, just, you know, I, I'm, uh, the, there's so many nuances about insurance coverage, and, and, um, and unfortunately, these drugs are not generic yet. If, if I have a patient who says that their, their copay, even with insurance coverage, is hundreds of dollars a month, we may try a different drug. Sometimes your pharmacy or your insurance has a contract with the, uh, the pharmaceutical company, and, and, you're, and an alternative blood thinner might be better covered. So I always like to run through the different options. Um, I, I have uh, like a gumball machine in my clinic where we, we give free samples out if, uh, if, if, if we can help with that. Um, but, but we, I, I will work together with, with, we work together with our patients to figure out a solution. There's, there's usually something we can do. I, I, I hate to have patients get stuck, uh, paying that much money to protect themselves from a stroke. Could you please talk about our supraventricular tachycardia, uh, intermittently, uh, intermittent episodes? Sure. So um, supraventricular tachycardia just means that it's a ra rapid heart rate or abnormal rhythm that comes from the top chamber, from the atria. Okay. So atrial fibrillation is one such supraventricular tachycardia, but most commonly when we talk or use that term, we're talking about a very specific pathway um, that's operating in the heart. Atrial fibrillation is very chaotic, many different areas. In supraventricular tachycardia, there may be one extra or abnormal pathway that's in operation. And this, again, is something sometimes people are born with. It can develop and manifest at different times in people's lives. It is also something that is treated much the same way, sometimes with medications, but often with ablation, and very successfully so because it's a very focal area that we address. Yeah, uh, ablation can be curative as opposed to atrial fibrillation where it's very effective but not necessarily curative. We can cure the typical kinds of supraventricular tachycardia with an ablation. And they're very safe, so we, we do recommend those. Um, somebody who has persistent AFib for 15 or 20 years, would uh, ablation help? So, we talk about success rates. We say 80% for paroxysmal, 60% uh, in general for persistent. Um, so we talk about what gets you into the 60% versus what puts you into that 40% failure rate. The time spent in atrial fibrillation is one of the biggest uh, determinants of success. So if a patient's been in atrial fibrillation really persistently for 15 years, the likelihood of success is low. Uh, on the horizon, and, and actually in practice these days, we are doing more aggressive types of ablations, like uh, the, um, the VATS maze was mentioned. Uh, there are uh, hybrid approaches where we, uh, where we combine forces, ablating from outside the heart and from inside the heart with the catheter in the vein, but also with a chest incision. Uh, that has started to show some optimism for patients who have been in AFib for years and years and years and years. Um, you know, we're believers, biased as we may be, that keeping you in a normal rhythm has benefit. Uh, so, so we, at least speaking for myself, um, like to consider all the options. So depending on each individual patient, we may discuss things like that, even if you've been in AFib for years and years and years. Yeah, I, I agree their options are growing, but really if you look at the data, once you've been in persistent AFib about 18 to 24 months, the success rates of our conventional ablation with a catheter start doing this. So it, it is important to act early. We might be running out of time. Any more questions? Can we have any more questions? Okay, they're saying no. <laughs> but we're, uh, we're happy to chat offline over uh, on the side by the, by the coffee bar. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Atrial. Okay, I, uh, by show of hands, how many of you ran your uh, EKG during that? Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm in sinus rhythm. My heart rate has been a little high, docs. The only reason I agreed to this job is I knew I was going to be surrounded by cardiologists. If I went down, you guys are ready, right? Okay. 
Um, so uh, we, we're really grateful. We're at halftime, right? So we've made it this far, and uh, we're going to have a 20-minute break. There's a, a boxed healthy brunch. It's mingle time, so we get to mingle with the doctors, but also in, in the back of the uh, auditorium here, we have all of the innovation partners and the community partners, so we hope that you're able to visit them and, and find out what they're providing. And then um, uh, the halftime show, uh, Dr. St. Gore, we didn't know about his singing talent, so we're going to, no, I'm just kidding. We're not, <laughs> we're, we're not going to bring him back. Uh, I tried to get him to agree. So, uh, so we will be back here at 11.05, 11.10, okay? So, all right. Actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, let, we'll have a clock. We'll, we'll, we'll call you back. And for the uh, at-home audience, we're going to show a video and a slide presentation of some of the innovations. So we're going to do a little uh, transition here. Um, we talked about the, the vessels plugging up, and then we did the electrical side. And now we're going to transition to what's called the structural heart space and valves. And I'm going to first give you guys a test. You remember all the valves that we learned about earlier? How many valves? Four. There we go. You passed, so we can keep going, right? Thank you. Um, no, so, so the valves obviously <laughs> keep the, um, the blood moving in the right direction. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm in my mid-60s. How many times have my valves opened and closed in the course of my life? Any guesses? Billion, almost two billion. When you think of anything that has to do that two billion times, that's, that's a pretty stressful. And the valves are really, really important to keeping the blood moving the right way. And over time, there are a couple of problems that occur, and you guys saw in the video, one is when they stiffen up and they get a little narrow. Remember what that was called? Stenosis. Stenosis. So the, the hole starts big and it, it pinches down. And if, if it goes backwards, it's called regurgitation, right? And you can imagine if either one of those occurs in one of the major valves, 
um, the forward output of blood obviously goes down and there's some backward flow too. And all sorts of things can happen, all sorts of symptoms that these guys will talk about, congestive heart failure and otherwise. And, and basically it is a, it's a structural problem so it, and a technical problem and it needs a technical solution to fix, right? There's no, you can't take aspirin, you can't take a little pill. You, you gotta fix the structure. And there are several things that can be done. One, the classic, which is really effective, open heart surgery to repair or replace the valves. And then more recently, the less invasive catheter-based approaches where you go in through the vessel and up into the heart and either repair or replace the valves. And we're gonna talk about all of those today and um, sort of give you a sense, hopefully give you some, uh, some language, some vocabulary to work with if you need to talk to your doctors and just give you a sense of how these all work. Now, with, when these problems arise, there, as I said, there's a variety of different options for the patients. And when there are options, that's when it's really, really important to get a variety of opinions and thoughts on how best to manage, treat and manage. And for that, what we have evolved, and El Camino is a real leader in that, is a team-based approach. And it is really, really, really important to have that, to get multiple different opinions, because as I say, there are a variety of different uh, of approaches, and um, it's not always obvious which is the best for which patient. And that team involves a cardiothoracic surgeon. It always involves a very strong imaging physician because you re really need to understand the physiology and the pathophysiology of the lesion. And then what's called an interventional cardiologist is the person in the cath lab who does the catheter work. So we are fortunate to have a couple of, very three actually very important members of the uh, El Camino um, valve team here. Um, we have uh, Conrad Vial, who is uh, in the center there, who, is, who actually is a pretty world-renowned cardiothoracic surgeon. So we're pretty honored, honestly, to have Conrad in our midst here. He's had a, a long and a really remarkable career as a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon. And um, also in his spare time, he's the uh, chief clinical officer at Sutter Health. So really just a very small spare time job, right? <laughs> Not a big deal at all. So thank you very much. And it, in, in some ways, one of the most important members of the team, Dr. Adipu Nair, is he's the imager. Uh, and that is, if you don't know what you're working on, if you can't really understand it, you can't even start to help the patient. So very, very integral. And Dr. Nair, um, he is a medical director of our advanced um, cardiac imaging service here at El Camino, as, as well as Sutter Health. And then the rock star HVI uh, individual, uh, Kathleen um, Musket, is she's a structural uh, heart clinical uh, nurse specialist. And Kathleen's gonna run the show here and she's gonna try to keep these two uh, gentlemen in line and keep this moving and hopefully you guys will all have a good sense of what structural and valve abnormalities are and what we do about it. So Kathleen, it's, take it over. I think what we're going to do is start with a, um, a case scenario, basically. It's typical to the kind of patients that we see in clinic. Um, I'll address this to both of you gentlemen. Uh, so the story is, Ms. Smith is a 65-year-old woman who has been followed closely by her cardiologist because she has an abnormal aortic valve shape. Instead of three leaflets, she only has two. Her last heart echo showed a narrowing of the aortic valve and a widening of the aorta just above the valve. In addition, she has experienced new onset fatigue while walking her dog. She's been referred to the multidisciplinary valve clinic for further evaluation. So I, I, I think the place, is this working well for everybody? Yeah, good. I think the place that we should start is that we've just heard about a patient um, and every patient who um, presents with anything like what was just described by Kathleen really deserves uh, an opportunity to have the problem looked at from a few different perspectives concurrently because our field has evolved to the point where we have uh, we have a lot of different options now available to people there used to be just one option 
uh, or really two, um, don't do anything and just try and palliate symptoms with, with medications, um, or open heart surgery. And, and the reality is we have other lesser invasive options right now. In order to make the right choice as to which amongst those options fits the patient that you have in front of you the best, you need to bring together a team of people who um, will be able together to offer a more complete picture to each other and ultimately to the patient of what's going on. In this particular case, we have a woman who's having symptoms that really fit well with uh, a valvular problem. In this particular case, it's the aortic valve, and we have evidence to indicate that there's some degree of limitation in the abilities for the valve to open. And, and that means that the heart is less efficient and struggles more to put blood into the system and power the circulation that we all depend on. And the question, the first question is, how, how bad is that stenosis? Um, and is it bad enough to be causing the symptoms? Second question is, if it is, what can be done about it? And along the road to identifying what can or should be done about it, you need to take a more comprehensive look at the entire cardiovascular system and be sure that there aren't some other incidental or correlated findings that require attention as well and that need to be folded into the, to the plan for intervention. And that's where this relationship becomes really, really important. Uh, no, I, well said, Conrad. So I think this is this field of structural heart disease. It's sort of a new, newish term, last decade or so. Dealing with the large structures of the, of the heart is one of the most exciting parts of cardiology, maybe one of the most rapidly expanding parts of cardiology. And you know, there was this era where we were really focused on coronary disease and stents and bypass surgery, and that's still very important. But as the technology has progressed and as we have these new options and as the imaging has, uh, has expanded, we have a whole new field of, of ideas and ways to treat these large structures. So um, to Conrad's point, I think the first step in a patient like this is often to do the usual stuff that a, that a cardiologist will do, uh, get a history and physical exam and check their heart with an ultrasound. Um, I don't know, Josh, if we have the image of an aortic valve, but we, we can see then with ultrasound usually what's going on with the valve. And this, uh, this can tell us then, is the valve narrow and to what degree? And I want to just emphasize what Conrad said, as the technology gets more complicated and there are more and more options, this field has become much more of a team sport than really ever it was before. I mean, it was always, we always had interdependent relationships, but now we really need a, a number of people to make a good decision for each patient. So on the, on the left image, on your right side, um, you can see the valve is a bit narrowed. This is a picture of a three leaflet valve, but we were told this patient had two leaflets called a bicuspid valve, which is a congenital, some, something you're born with. And this abnormality can cause the valve to fail earlier in life. In this case, the patient also, it was mentioned, had an enlarged aorta, which these things sometimes go together. We heard about the aorta being the large tube that carries blood out of the heart. And so, as Conrad said, when we look at patients, we want to get all of the information from their history and their imaging, and then we want to see is there one good solution that could fix all of these problems at the same time so that we don't leave the patient with a, you know, a residual problem. Um, so in this case, just hearing what we've heard so far, this is probably one that I'm guessing, after we did all of this testing, I would call Conrad back and say, this might be in your, in your neck of the woods. And, and the reason for that in this particular case is um, partially due to the fact that there's really at least two targets here um, that we need to try and hit for the benefit of the patient. Um, there's the valve, and we'll come back to that in just a moment, but alongside the valve, and in fact, related to the fact that this valve is abnormal in its, in its structure, it's two leaflets or two cusps, that's the word bicuspid that you heard, um, rather than, than the, the more typical or the majority type three leaflets. We know those valves can wear out sooner, but we also know they can be correlated with abnormal enlargements of the aorta. 
uh, particularly the segment of the aorta that is, is close, just downstream um, from, the, from the valve that you were seeing there on the, on the graphic before. Um, and although in some places in the body, we are able to actually um, exclude and bolster and, uh, and essentially repair from inside a segment of aorta that is, that is dilated. Um, in this particular case, we really can't put a stent in there through a, what we call an endovascular approach. And that's because it's so close to not only the vessels that provide uh, support and blood flow to the heart muscle itself, just above the valve, those are the coronary arteries you were learning about earlier, but it's also pretty close to where the aorta takes an arch and, and arches to the left side and sends off blood vessels to the brain and to the upper extremities. And so because of that, in order to remove the threat of rupture of this enlarged area uh, of the aorta, we require an open surgical approach to essentially remove that disease segment of the aorta and replace it with a synthetic tube made out of, it's a polyester-like um, material. So right off the bat there, we know that it's not just about the valve. We're gonna have to do something about the aorta. That something will require a surgical replacement. And so it immediately starts to make sense that at the same time we should be managing the valve problem surgically as well. Um, there are other aspects to the valve itself that are important. Sometimes a transcatheter, um, aortic valvular replacement strategy in certain types of bicuspid valves works fine. And if you didn't have the aneurysmal aorta, patient might be a candidate for that. But there are other times when it doesn't work as well because the current technology was originally developed to replace three leaflet valves that were stenotic, not necessarily all two leaflet valves, and that's where we get back to the kind of rigor and imaging interpretation that Dr. Nyer is capable of contributing to the team. When we look at the ultrasound closely, when we look at the CT scan, we can at times determine that actually, even if there isn't an aneurysmal segment of the aorta, we need to replace the valve surgically. And that actually sets the patient up. In this case, it's a young patient. Sets the patient up for success in the future. Maybe you want to talk about that. Sure. And this allows, allows me to highlight the technology that Dr. Vial just referred to, which is called transcatheter aortic valve replacement. It's one of the amazing inventions of the past decade. Um, and El Camino has been at the forefront, actually, of, of, of this procedure. Dr. Vial, others in this room, Dr. Ramahan, who isn't here today, um, have been involved in this. And this is an amazing procedure where going from an artery in the leg, the large valve can be threaded through the aorta and replaced from the inside without the need to make an incision in the chest. And that can replace the need in some cases for surgery. Now, in this particular case, because it doesn't address the aorta, it's not our first choice, but let's say this patient gets surgery by Dr. Vial, spends a, a few days in the hospital, uh, five days in the hospital, goes home, and then that the replaced valve may fail eventually. These replaced valves don't last forever, so maybe 10 years later, that valve may fail. Historically, the only thing we used to be able to do was a second surgery, which is still an option, but is obviously complicated to have a, you know, a big surgery twice. And so second, the other way is we can then re-replace the valve using this TAVR procedure the second time around. So the initial valve serves sort of as a scaffold for us to put the second valve in. And that actually is a very well-tolerated procedure. Often people go home within a couple of days of that procedure, and they have a new valve now, which can last them hopefully another 10 years or longer. So that's a very exciting new development. So we, not only do we try to fix the problem now, but now with these new technologies, we need to kind of think about the 20-year plan, the 30-year plan. What are we going to do down the road when this technology fails or when, when a problem comes up? Yeah, I, I would say that I, I, I think we need to be availing ourselves of the opportunity to create a solution that not only fix, fixes the problem, if you will, that's right in front of us, but sets us up for further interventions in the future should they become necessary um, that in, in many instances can be accomplished minimally invasively if we do the right thing up front. Quickly, gentlemen. Yes. <laughs>
There is another procedure that we do in structural heart. Um, and so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background of a patient, and perhaps we could talk about the mitral valve now. Um, Mr. Brown is a 75-year-old man with a history of coronary bypass surgery. He recovered completely and resumed his normal activities, thanks in no small part to his cardiac rehab classes. Over the years, he has been followed by his cardiologist who noted some leaking or regurgitation in his mitral valve. It has now progressed to severe regurgitation, and Mr. Brown has been forced to reduce his activities due to shortness of breath. His cardiologist has referred him to the multidisciplinary valve clinic for evaluation. So we always start the same place, so getting a good history physical, and this is a plug for imaging. So this is a field, mitral valve disease, and um, maybe we can show the image of the mitral valve, but when, when the mitral valve is leaking, we try to get all of the right imaging through echo and other, C other technologies sometimes, CT or MRI can be involved to get an idea of exactly what the problem is. Is the valve torn? Are the leaflets getting pulled apart? The image on the left, that jet that you see going backwards is backflow through the mitral valve. And this often can occur when people, as people get older because the valve can tear because of just wear and tear on the leaflets, though there are a long list of causes of mitral valve disease. When this happens, this can cause backflow of blood which causes shortness of breath and can cause other problems like heart failure. And again, historically, the best initial solution used to be, and, and in some cases still is, surgery to fix the valve, which Dr. Vial will discuss. But we wanted to highlight also the uh, ability to do transcatheter techniques to fix the mitral valve. And I also want to call out Dr. Senghor, wherever he is, who is uh, the inventor of the, of the technology we're going to highlight here, which is called mitral clip. Um, and amazingly, this global technology was invented by our very own Dr. Senghor and is now has served hundreds of, correct me if I'm wrong, hundreds of thousands, 200,000 people, Fred says from the back. So um, it, it, he's really changed the world here. And this pr procedure involves going in from, with catheters. You see how we, we ha have a theme here. Go in with a catheter and cross that hole, like we said, with the e electro electrical procedures and then go in and place this clip on the valve to capture the torn segment. Um, and there are a lot of details, but to do this well, you really have to be able to see the valve and figure out exactly where the problem is. And that's some of the challenge of planning for this procedure, and it really requires a team-based approach to, to make that decision. And Conrad? So I, I, I'm, I'm in earnest when I say to you that some of the most exciting and fulfilling um, care delivery interactions that I've had with colleagues and with patients have been about finding reasons uh, not to operate, <laughs> not to do open heart surgery. In a, in a patient who's already had an open heart intervention for another reason, going back in is certainly doable and fully a fifth of the cases that I do are um, those kinds of reoperative situations. But if you can avoid that, and avoid the, the additional risks associated with doing that and solve the problem through the, for the patient through a minimally invasive approach. Uh, not only are you helping that patient, but the availability of that technology opens up the opportunity to help many more patients that might otherwise have been able to be helped if all we had was the open surgical approaches of the past. And this is why Dr. St. Gore's invention and the entire team that worked with him to bring this forward and the very robust research that has been done on this um, and that we've participated in all along here um, is such a service um, to patient communities far and wide. This is, a, this is a real game changer. It has been, just like Taber. And, and just on that point, I think this is a, a, a rapidly changing field. And it's one of the reasons it's so exciting is that none of these procedures were things that were really done commonly when, when I finished training or when I joined here 15 years ago. They were just kind of starting. And now every year, this is a rapidly changing field. We are involved in a trial of fixing the tricuspid valve. There are now procedures to put new valves in all of the other valves that we mentioned, you know, pulmonic, tricuspid, mitral. And so there's the innovation of Silicon Valley has really shown itself, and, and, and the world really has shown itself in this field with the explosion of new technologies, which is great, but is complicated because as a patient, it's, it can be hard to navigate what's the best choice. And so we're, if finding a team of people that are willing to talk to each other and discuss you and your best option and weigh your other medical problems 
is, is probably really at the heart of getting the best outcome. Pun intended. I realized it as I was saying it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe some questions from the audience, both online and in person. Oh, hold on, that's one second. We have a, we have a oh, the mic's coming. A, here comes a mic. Yep. Uh, in the repair, what is the longevity of that repair typically? So in, in, the, uh, in the instance of surgically repaired valves, the intent is to confer a lifelong benefit on the patient. Uh, the data that we have to really look at that um, uh, is about is covering only about 20 years at this point uh, in our surgical experience. And techniques have continued to evolve over that time period, and therefore the numbers and the types of valves that were or are now amenable in the right hands to repair versus replacement has, has expanded with that increased knowledge and experience. And so it'll be a few years before we really can truly objectively test uh, by following patients, um, whether or not uh, that is the the in fact the case that it is a lifelong repair. Um, that said, that's one type of repair. We've just talked about a catheter-based type of repair, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about the, sure. the outcomes there. I, I want to emphasize that not for young patients who have valve problems. Usually, often the surgical approaches are still the favored approaches because of the ability and the data that this will last your whole life, hopefully. Um, and many of, so the patients for whom we consider technologies like MitraClip are typically considered high risk for surgery for some reason. Like for example, they've already had surgery. So not everybody should have this, mitra, this, exam, this technology. But when it works well, which is now most of the time, and, and uh, this is usually a durable repair, and we can often reduce the leakiness of the valve from severe to mild, most of the patients in whom we do this procedure are elderly, and that's why we're not, they're not uh, uh, considering a surgery right off the bat. And often it serves them for their whole life without trouble. So, but all of these things are um, very individual and everyone's valve is different, and so the challenges can be different. And there are cases where, where these technologies, where no catheter-based technology would work, and a, a more extensive surgery may be needed uh, in order to fix the problem. Maybe a question from online? Um, sure. So um, someone would like to know what the different cardiac tests are available to help identify aortic valve disease. Uh, so there are a lot of tests out there, um, starting with a, a physical exam. Um, for aortic valve disease, it turns out that listening with a stethoscope is pretty, pretty good at getting at least to ruling out severe problems. Um, that because many of them cause a heart murmur, that's pretty obvious. But our probably our best go-to technology is ultrasound, is echo. And echo is something I'm excited about, and, and many of us in the room are, uh, really spend a lot of time reading ultrasounds. It's an easy, non-invasive bedside or outpatient type of test where we put an ultrasound probe on the chest, kind of like, a, I often say ultrasound like People are familiar, familiar with ultrasounds for maternal scans or when people are pregnant. Similar idea, just a picture of the heart. And we can see the valves working. We can make measurements using uh, Doppler and other ultrasound techniques. And we can measure the valve and tell with great accuracy exactly how narrowed the valve is. There's a whole another series of more advanced types of tests, CT scans, MRIs, what's called a transesophageal echo, where we put a probe down the throat to take better pictures of the heart that are sometimes needed. And usually just physical exam and echo, though, is, is the number one way to kind of make a diagnosis. Yes. I've had aneurysms put in, eclipse put in to prevent aneurysms from basically blowing and causing a stroke. You talk about the mitral valve clip that it lets the blood still go through but not come back up. Can you go into that a little bit more? How does it allow? because I'm trying to put the two together. Yeah. When you put a clip on, normally it stops something from happening. Yeah, so, uh, How does it work for the heart? I, th I, th I think I'm understanding your question, so keep me honest here. But um, for example, in the, in the brain, in the, in the cerebral circulation, there can be aneurysms that are clipped for the purpose of essentially excluding them. 
So you've got an area where there's a sac-like protrusion from the wall of the tube, if you will, and you put a clip on the outside of the vessel so that essentially blood coursing through the tube no longer has access to that area that became weakened. And in that regard, you are preventing, as you pointed out, a, a, a rupture and, and stroke, et cetera. In the case of the clip on the valve, what we're doing is we're actually working from within the circulation. Uh, the clip is actually dwelling within the circulatory path of blood. The mitral valve works because there are two specialized flaps of tissue, we call them leaflets, that essentially function like a two, two planed or two leaflet trap door. And when there's leakage, a clip placed in the middle portion permits, when the valve is open, for blood to access and flow uh, down into the ventricle, um, more or less unobstructed. The opening now is no longer a single channel opening, it's a two channel opening because there's a clip in the middle, but the clip maintains a level of alignment between the two leaflets such that when the valve is meant to be closing, those leaflets are in a position to interact with one another more normally, if you will, to achieve that closure. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. The valve still opens and the ventricle can fill, the pumping chamber can fill um, adequately, but when the valve is meant to be closed, the leaflets are better aligned to be able to do that. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, I think that top view on the bottom right illustrates Dr. Vial's point where you, you're sort of clipping the middle of the valve but the sides open. And one of the big challenges with this procedure is you're always making the valve a little narrower. And so sometimes we put one, two, three clips on, we have to always make sure that we're not narrowing the valve, which is another, another problem altogether. Any other questions from online? Yes, if you have a mitra clip and the leaking persists, what would the next steps be? So um, we know, uh, and actually the, the record of accomplishment in this program in the hands of, of my colleagues technically and of all of us, if you will, from an intellectual decision-making perspective, um, the, the results have been excellent in this regard in terms of the amount of residual regurgitation or leakage that patients are experiencing after the placement of a clip. That has everything to do with the imaging interpretation up front and the proper selection of patients um, on the basis of a known ability or forecasted ability for them to benefit. Um, in some instances, if you look at the worldwide experience um, with MitraClip, uh, the amount of reduction in the degree of leakage is not as much as one would have intended or the care team intended. And in those instances, it depends very much on the patient in terms of what the next step is. Some patients were receiving the mitra clip because it was known up front that they were really not appropriate candidates for any form of open surgical intervention. Other times, it's more of a relative indication, and we think that the patient could have surgery, but that they had sufficient burden of risk that trying a mitra clip first makes sense. And in those cases, if the mitra clip doesn't achieve the benefit that we were after, or that the care team was after, there may be an opportunity for surgical intervention um, because you haven't burnt that bridge. That surgical intervention almost always uh, requires surgical replacement of the mitral valve with a mitral valve prosthesis, but we know that in the patient populations in whom this kind of uh, two-step process might occur, um, we know that they, they can be benefited from that. But we're always trying to achieve the most benefit for the least risk. And the, the approach that the team takes is, hey, for this patient, do we think a clip has a decent chance or a good chance of, of benefiting the patient? And sometimes, if you're not entirely sure, you give the patient the benefit of the doubt, have them try that first, and then if it doesn't work, there may be surgical options on the other side of that if the patient is a fit surgical candidate. Any, anything more? No, I, I agree. I think that? that's exactly right. And I think I would just, there are cases where we could place an additional clip sometimes. Um, so there are times occasionally where another procedure could be done, but I, Dr. Vial's uh, summary is exactly right. And um, the nice thing about many of these procedures is that the risk is very low. So the procedural risk in, in 
for for mitriclid, for example, is exceedingly low. It's nearly zero percent complication rate, and so uh, because of that issue, it, it, it's it's a, some, worth considering for many people now. Again, that's because of patient selection. When if we if we did it for everyone, it wouldn't work as well. But if you pick the right people, then then it does tend to work well. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the information, and it's amazing that uh, this was invented here. The clip. Um, the question I had was with respect to shortness of breath in the context of the discussion here. Uh, what practically uh, or physiologically causes the shortness of breath in this uh, context? So, uh, great question. So the question is what makes you short of breath with mitral valve disease? And it's actually the direct backflow of blood uh, going backwards through the valve raises the pressure in the upper chamber and that the next place backwards from there is the lung and the lung blood vessels. And it turns out your upper chamber and your lungs have sensors for pressure. And so as the pressure goes up, you will feel short of breath. Um, and there will be, there'll be a, a sensation that you're not getting a deep breath. If it gets more severe, there can actually be fluid buildup in the lungs. And, and that's a form of heart failure related to the valve disease, which makes people extremely short of breath. But even just the high pressure is sensed by the body. And usually people feel out of breath. Did you have a question for before? I was just going to comment that when you were speaking about it, you spoke about the aneurysm. Yes. And I was thinking that when you were saying about the mitral valve, this and this and this, I was trying to think about my neurological section. If there were like seven or, or five of them in there, you would put a mitral in each of those in, instead of doing surgery. And then I concluded five years. So you're wondering whether you could use it in other parts of the body. Yeah, I don't think you'd want it in the brain. That would probably not go well. <laughs> but but no, I mean it's it. You know, the, Dr. Sangor had mitral clip on the brain for a lot of yeah. years. And you can see what happened there. Yeah, exactly. He's turned out pretty well, so it might work. I don't know. Sure. Well, well to sure. your point, people are coming up with these ideas all the time. You know, well, oh, why don't we put it on this valve, you know, or that valve? <laughs> and and it's it's how the field is progressing. There's a lot of innovators in this area just thinking about different ways to use these technologies. Okay. Got the hook. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, let's all take a deep breath. My brain is hurting. I'm learning so, I'm learning so many wonderful things. Um, at this point, we're really pleased um, to have uh, with us, uh, we, we like to have the voice of the patient. And uh, what's wonderful about uh, the next person we're gonna bring to us is she is one of our real patients. And she was in between the two panels that we're gonna, so, she benefited from the work that this panel talked about with the valves, and then she, she benefited from the other, the final panel, the rehabilitation. So without further ado, let me bring Carol Pollard to our stage. <clears throat> we, we love to hear her story. Um, hello, and, and thank you. I'm very happy to be with you here today. And as I say those words, I just saw a clip of George Burns saying them, saying, I'm very happy to be with you here today, although I'm happy to be anywhere today. <laughs> and I can certainly relate to that. But it is really a privilege to be here to speak with you but this was a very hard way to get a speaking gig, and I wouldn't advise it. Uh, um, and before I start my story, I just want to thank a few people. Um, I want to thank Dr. Ramahan for his skill in placing the mitral valve clip in my heart. I want to thank Dr. Fred St. Gore for all the work that he did to develop this gem. Um, I'd like to di thank Dr. Weiss, who I've never seen again. He was the anesthesiologist who came into my room before the surgery and explained in such great detail what was about to happen to me that it, it just, it was, I was awestruck 
at the, the teamwork and, and the skills going into this procedure. And so if, if he's not here and anybody knows him, would you please thank him for me? Um, I want to thank um, Nurse Kathleen Mascott because she came into my room the day I was being released from the hospital after the procedure and gave me wonderful information and then told me, you go home and I want you to call this number. It's the Cardiac Rehabilitation Program at El Camino and you get on their radar and they won't take you now. You have to get strong enough, but when you're ready, call them and get on the program. And that's exactly what I did, Kathleen. And I'd like to thank um, Nurse Karen Roman because she is part of the rehab team uh, who did some wonderful mindfulness classes there. And she got me involved with the women's support group. They knitted this scarf for me as a gift for joining. Um, and I would like to thank Julie Arbuckle, the manager at the cardiac rehab for the fabulous job that she does running that program and the wonderful people that she has staffing it. Um, so about six years ago, I started having some slight chest discomfort, um, a little trouble breathing and a lot of fatigue. But it took four cardiologists before I was diagnosed. And the fourth cardiologist I was sent to was Dr. Ramahan. I was sent there for the mitral valve clip procedure and he thought I was a good candidate. However, he saw something in the pretest that bothered him. And although he had scheduled the procedure, he canceled it. I remember being so, so disappointed, I cried. But um, he sent me to a heart disease specialist. They did a heart biopsy and discovered that Dr. Ramahan was correct. I have a very rare heart disease called cardiac amyloidosis. And the way it, it was explained to me is it's a rogue protein that developed in my bone marrow, transferred into my blood, and then attacked my heart, and is probably attacking my kidneys and, um, and my um, GI tract, as we speak. Um, and the only treatment for it is chemotherapy. So I started chemo the week after my diagnosis. I was going weekly with a lot of drugs. Um, I lasted about four months before I got very sick with two infections, and I had to be hospitalized. And by the time I got out of the hospital, I wasn't able to walk and talk at the same time. I was so weak, I could hardly do anything. And it took about six weeks of physical therapy to get strong enough to go back to chemo. And when I did, they did get me into um, remission. However, I have to remain in chemo because these proteins can hide in places that are not easily detected. And so I go monthly for chemo still. Um, the biggest problem I was having at that time though, even though I was in remission was I could not breathe. I felt some days like I was suffocating, and it got to the point where I couldn't breathe, and then I was having panic attacks, which didn't help the breathing. Um, and, and I was referred back to Dr. Ramahan to see if he'd be willing to work with me on the mitral valve clip. And when we called, he was out of the country, and he was getting back the next day. And his office went into action so fast, it was miraculous. I had an appointment within two days, and a week later, I was here at El Camino for the procedure. And Dr. Ramahan talked to me, and he warned me, he said, now, I don't want you to have any high expectations, because your heart is damaged, and this procedure isn't going to do anything to help that, but it might work to help with the breathing. And so I promised him I wouldn't have high expe expectations, but of course, I lied. I was very hopeful. <laughs> and. Um, I want to tell you, the day after that procedure, I could breathe again. And it was, it was really miraculous. I, um, and before I was released from the hospital, Kathleen Maskett came in to speak with me and gave me some wonderful information and told me, when you get home, I want you to call this number. It's the cardiac rehab program at El Camino and get on their radar. They won't take you now because you're too weak, but when you get strong enough, you, you get into that program. So I followed her instructions, 
And I think it was six to eight weeks later, I was in the program. It was a 36 week session. And by the end of that program, I was walking two miles at three miles per hour at a, an elevation of five and I was lifting weights a couple of times a week. And what that did for me was it allowed me to do the everyday mundane things that I had taken for granted, like going grocery shopping and being able to carry in my own bags, um, changing my bed without having to fall into it afterwards. Um, just, just ordinary things that I am so grateful to be able to do. And although this journey has been very dark at times, there have been some rainbows, and one of them, of course, is being able to stand here before you today. But another one which always makes me smile is the night that I met Dr. Fred St. Gore, he told me that Elizabeth Taylor said her mitral valve clip was the most precious jewel that she owned. So here I am at age 78, and I have something in common with Elizabeth Taylor besides our beauty. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, and <laughs> I know there's a million pieces that go into this puzzle of, of miracles that this institute creates here, and I just hope that everyone realizes how important all of the jobs are that everyone does here uh, to make miracles for so many thousands of people like me. And yesterday, I happened to be on Facebook, and I saw I saw a, a poem written by a Bay Area artist, and it really rang true for me. It's very short, and I'd like to read it to you, because I think it'll have some meaning for you, too, also. It's called Ruins by Frank Sirocco. With each new day, we reassemble our broken pieces to face what is next to come, both magnificent and mundane, at times rewarding, but often painful constantly questioning our purpose while searching for intangible growth that is accompanied too often by sorrow or worse, and so ridiculously difficult to obtain, especially when there are only fragments to sift through. Then with awareness comes the realization we are not alone in this shattering experience, and there's only one healing way to rebuild by helping each other restore their broken parts instead of choosing to climb over them. So thank, thank you all, and thanks to my wonderful husband and two children and my family for helping me to restore my broken parts. Thank you. Wow. Can we have the next panel wander up? Yeah, it was warms my heart and brings tears. Talking about giving back after having appreciated what we have here at wait, I want to get in that too. Wait, wait. <laughs> It always, it always just, it warms my heart and, and brings tears. But so, and, and she, Carol, did a wonderful job of explaining what we're now going to finish off talking about. And that is the concept of continuum of care. And that's exactly what El Camino really takes very, very significantly. So a few years ago, when, when this place was built, what was it called? It was called El Camino Hospital, right? But no, then a few years ago, and very appropriately, they changed their name to El Camino Health. 
And why is that? And the reason is, as I say, they so seriously now take this whole concept of continuum of care, and that includes getting out into the community with education, with wellness, and trying to instill that early on. And then equally as importantly, is after patients are here in the hospital, whether they have a procedure or whatever, continue to manage them and help them. And that specifically for cardiovascular disease is an incredible, an incredible cardiopulmonary wellness center that we have three rock stars here that are going to explain. First and foremost, Julie Arbuckle, who manages, who you already heard mentioned several times today, manages the, the uh, Cardiopulmonary Wellness Center. And uh, Julie, so honestly, Julie, I think, is one of the few people in the room who's been at El Camino longer than me. She always reminds me of that. <laughs> she, 33 years. I'm 32. And I, I always tell her she started in high school, so she had a jump start on me. But no, and, and she has had an amazing career at the institution. She was in the emergency room. She's worked in the ICU. And for the last now 12 years, I want to be careful, I quote appropriately, 12 years, she has directed this in, incredible um, wellness program that we now have at the hospital. Seated next to her is Dr. Um, Puneet Sarna, um, who is a, a clinical cardiologist, so fully trained in clinical cardiology, but then he even took a little extra step and he spent some time um, as a specialty in congestive heart failure. So we again are, are very privileged to have a congestive heart failure specialist. And he and Dr. Ahmad uh, oversee and are medical directors of our heart failure program here at the hospital. Do a great job with that. And then last but certainly not least, my dear friend, Dr. Neil Scott, who, like me, is a long timer here at El Camino. <laughs> Not old, you're just a long timer. Uh, right? Isn't that where we are? No, honestly. So, um, Neil is my partner and has been my partner for, for quite a few years. And so, Neil not only um, got an MD at that Stanford wannabe school back in Cambridge, I think it's called Harvard, but <laughs> he spent a bunch of extra years getting a PhD. So, he brings to his patient care an extraordinary amount of intellect and academic science-based approach with his patients. But not only that, he injects an extraordinary amount of compassion and empathy and really is a model for how all of us should be cardiologists. He's been an amazing um, person, amazing player in our community for years. And I can't thank you enough, Neil, for, for all you've done for all of us here in the community. It's really been wonderful. And he also helps now run with Julie, the. Uh, the cardiopulmonary wellness. So, Julie, take it away. Thank okay. you. Okay, well, that was sure a hard act to follow. Carol, you should get the Academy Award. That's right. <laughs> and it was a pleasure working with you. Um, our team just loves you. So, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to share your story because it's pretty amazing. So, we have the last part of it, which is medical cardiology. And it doesn't sound as sexy as all the other ones that came before us, but sometimes medical management is just as important as having procedures. So I'm gonna start with a scenario of Mrs. Jones, and she has a history of high blood pressure, she has high cholesterol, and she also is a little bit overweight. So it's kind of a typical patient that we see in our population on a daily basis. So she um, has been experiencing uh, increased shortness of breath and fatigue over the last couple of months. Uh, in the last two weeks, she's noticed that she's had some lower leg swelling, mostly in her ankles and her feet. Uh, she knows the importance of exercise, so one day she goes out for a walk and she becomes extremely short of breath. She just can't get any air in and she ends up in the emergency room. And Dr. Sarna, you get called and said, this, we need you to come and do a, a cardiology evaluation. So take us through your process and how you might medically work her up. Sure, absolutely. Um, so very typical presentation. We, we get that call multiple times a day. And uh, you know, every time that, that presentation um, is made, you're organizing your thoughts around how sick is this patient? Is this somebody that is in some form of distress? Do they need to go to the ICU? Do they need a more emergent procedure? And you heard earlier today from, from uh, both our electrophysiologist and our interventionalist 
um, we need to know uh, early on, do we need to pull those folks in? So some of the tests that are already being done in the emergency room are helping navigate that. Uh, some of the blood work, you heard about troponin markers, if there's some injury to the heart. The EKG may seem, sound simple, but is actually uh, really informative. Is this somebody that is having some ischemia, some heart blockage? Are they having a rhythm problem? Uh, could Mrs. Jones be having AFib? Um, or has she um, had a heart attack at home that she didn't recognize and now is coming in with some new onset heart failure? And so assuming that things are stable in the emergency room, we, we come in and we want to uh, get a chance to meet her, examine her, and, and get a gauge on, on where she is on that spectrum of urgency. And um, based on some of those tests, we may order, uh, as you've heard earlier today, um, additional tests such as an echocardiogram to look at her heart function um, and see if the valves are working okay. How is the heart squeezing and relaxing? Um, all of those are tests, those maneuvers are gonna start to paint a picture of, of what's going on. And, um, and then based on that, we can start some treatment. Sometimes it may be as simple as some diuretics to help get some fluid off. But we really wanna have a, a, a deeper understanding of why she's coming in, what has started to not work well. And uh, it may actually just be something as simple as hypertension that wasn't treated but it could be something more complicated. And so uh, that would kind of be the initial um, approach until we get a, a little more of an in-depth uh, understanding of what's going on. It's also an exciting time to do the maybe not so sexy medical cardiology because the medications that are available are, I mean, truly uh, life-altering. And you can, I mean, I, 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 I see a few of my patients here in the audience today and hopefully at home as well. Um, they'll tell you, I, I mean, the, the, um, uh, the entire um, uh, um, uh, list of medications that have come through that are truly shown to help extend life, to reduce mortality, um, it's just amazing. So it's an amazing time to, to confront these challenges. And we always want our patients to know that you know, we're there with them. We want them to get the best treatments, uh, the, the latest um, uh, technologies that can help. And that may, that's not just the uh, physical procedures, it's also the medications, but then also a lot of what we do uh, in cardiac rehab and hopefully uh, uh, altering the trajectory of their, their life going forward. So anything to, anything to add? Well, one of the things we always look at in our patients is once they get close to discharge or once they're out of the hospital, how do we keep them from coming back into the hospital? And that's the importance of cardiac rehab. So if you have a prior diagnosis, like in the hospital of a heart attack or a stent or valve surgery, um, or a new diagnosis of, congest of a type of congestive heart failure where your squeezing is not as good as it should be, then you're eligible for cardiac rehab. And there, what we will do is teach our patients how to change their lives. We stress the importance of exercise. We stress the importance of an appropriate diet that is either a Mediterranean diet or a predominantly plant-based diet. We teach stress reduction so that, and it's, as you heard, it's a pretty intensive um, program of three times a week, 12 weeks um, for the whole session. So again, the whole goal of that is to change the course of people's lives so they live healthier, they're happier, and are less likely to be admitted to the hospital. And Julie has been phenomenal in running that program day to day.
Well, I'll elaborate a little bit on cardiac rehab. Um, so any patient that comes through our hospital that's had any of the interventions that you saw today, they get an automatic referral to cardiac rehab. So I can't take all the credit. I have a wonderful team of exercise physiologists and nurses that work alongside with me that really do make a difference for patients. Um, we're very big on lifestyle. Back in the day, cardiac rehab used to come in. It was just about exercise, and then you would leave. And what we would see is the same people were coming back. And it was like, what are we not doing right? And so what we've done is we've really turned it into lifestyle medicine. So we really emphasize it's not just what you're doing with your feet. We know exercise is important. But we incorporated a food as medicine program. So we have a full-time dietitian. We're very fortunate to have her. And she does a really great job on educating our pa patients about a plant-strong diet. And she does cooking demonstrations. And she gives them recipes. And they really get an idea that what you put in your body really does make a difference in the longevity of how long you live. And it definitely affects your heart. And then. I have a great nurse, Karen, which Carol talked about, and she does our Stress Matters program. And uh, we know stress is a huge component of cardiovascular disease. And we work on techniques of actually how can we identify your personal stresses. We do mindful meditation. We look at self-care strategies. And we even throw a little bit of laughter yoga into our program. And the patients really love that. Uh, we've also incorporated strength training because we know that's an important part of your overall fitness and it really does make a difference in your glucose and I know they mentioned it earlier we don't want a lot of we don't want high blood sugars that's not good for our body in general and it's definitely not good for our heart um, and then we work on balance um, you know it's not just the 80 year olds that fall but younger people can fall too so it's really important that we engage everybody in balance and core training so we really have a like i said a lifestyle approach to how we do cardiac rehab and um, as much as our patients don't want to graduate at some point we do have to push them out the door because we hope that the time they spend with us they have the tools that they need to continue what they learned in the program and take it outside um, because our goal is to get them independent. We want them to get back doing the things that they were doing, like Carol said. It was just making a bed or going to the grocery store. So we really try to individualize it to our patients as well. Like we want them to meet their goals, their personal goals. And I mean, I think that by the time they graduate, I always give the description when they come through the door on their first session, they're like a hummingbird. Their eyes are like, and they're. And when they leave, it's like an eagle. Their wings are spread, and they like fly out like an eagle. They have the confidence they need. They've got the tools that they need. And then, hopefully, we don't see them again. We get to see them in the office <laughs> afterwards, and it is, it's day and night. I mean, they really come in, and, and uh, they're different people. They are, the, I think, the confidence, the self-esteem, it's back, and, and they're, they're moving forward. Yeah, so we definitely see the difference. So let's turn it over some, to questions, and not just in the room, but also Zoom, Kathleen. Anybody have questions? They're coming. Uh, thank you for the program. Anyway, that was very interesting. Uh, my question is regarding lifestyle. We are uh, individuals close to 80s, and uh, we still like to take long transatlantic travels. We are facing another trip like that in two weeks, which means taking a 15-hour flight to a continent where, which is nine hours ahead, and everything is different. My question is, would you suggest anything one should do to sort of prepare oneself for a trip like that, especially since one of us experienced on the uh, visiting trip here a heart attack on the plane that happened on the flight to America. So we would not like to happen anything like that to us. So maybe some things that we should know that we don't think about. Thank you. I think the easiest answer for that is to discuss 
this issue with your doctor, who's aware of your particular problems, issues, and can address um, whether or not you should be, you know, what kind of medicines you should be on for such a long flight, if any. And that's probably the best way to go, is to talk to your doctor. So what's the basic question? Do you think it's a good idea to see a doctor before the trip? To see your doctor? Yes. Yes. Your, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'll chime in. I think I saw you guys walk in. You look like you're pretty active. Um, so I think that the trip is going to be easy for you, but I would encourage you to get up out of your seats when you're on the airplane because, you know, blood tends to pool into the lower extremities. You want to make sure you're getting up and moving around. Um, but I think you guys look like you're ready to go. <laughs> you only live once, so live it good. Is this on? Yeah. So Julie and you guys, um, just a quick question here that... Uh, I frequently hear the comment, I would like your guys' opinion on it, that we all know that we, when we pass away, we will have some degree of cardiovascular disease. Nobody gets, gets out without any. The question is, uh, and we also know that it's the greatest killer around the world, but what do you guys think about the concept that it really is optional? Are there things that we can specifically do to be absolutely sure that we do not have a terminal event from cardiovascular disease? Well, I'm gonna tell you there's no guarantees in life. So I've seen people in my, my cardiac rehab program, they walk in and I think they've found the wrong place. They, they don't look like they had a heart attack. Their weight's perfect. They look super athletic. I mean, we know heart disease you know, covers all age groups, all ethnic races. I think there are things you can do preventively to help and I think Regular exercise is huge. I think getting sleep, controlling your stress, weight management, and then I'm a big component. Get together with people. I mean, COVID didn't do us well, but we are human beings. We're social. We need that social interaction. We need to find those people that make us laugh. We need to, we have so much seriousness in this world today. We just need to find a little downtime and just really enjoy life. I'd just add to that, uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, that, along with what, uh, what, what Julie was just saying is, is truly like understanding what are the things in your life that you can control? What can you change? I talk to patients, uh, Dr. Scott and I both talk to patients at length about their lifestyle, about their diet. And, uh, you know, people say, hey, you know, no one ever jumped up out of bed excited to go see their doctor, but they come in and, and you know, oftentimes it's a serious matter. They're, they're worried about uh, what's, what they're contending with. They want to know how, what they can do to, to reverse that. And, um, and oftentimes it's, it really is the simple things that can have the biggest impact, your diet. But I think a lot of times patients may not, we don't do a great job of, of uh, telling people. You know, marketing campaigns really kind of skew our, our thoughts on, uh, on, uh, on wellness. And I'll give you an example of, um, you know, Dr. Scott mentioned a plant-based diet. Um, a plant-based diet is a wonderful way. I, I haven't met anybody who couldn't benefit from that. But uh, if you tell somebody, you can't eat this, this, and this, and this, and then they, they, they kind of look at you like, what do you want me to do? And, and we want to show them that, no, there's, there's a whole wonderful uh, uh, plethora of, of things that you can do. We're eating every four or six hours. And if you're eating for your wellness, oh, man, that can have such a huge impact on, on everything else. Um, and that's just one aspect of it, you know. Uh, staying, uh, staying on top of your medications, that can also uh, really add a lot of value to your health, your recovery, and avoid problems. So I, I think that there, there is this theme that you've heard today through several of the speakers of, of lifestyle, of wellness. Uh, you know, we have different departments, but honestly, it is a very comprehensive approach to to your health, your well-being, your longevity. Yeah, and on a, on, oh, you have a question. Sorry. 
There are different guidelines for diet for my three favorite health foods, dark chocolate, red wine, and coffee. <laughs> so do I have to limit or, because I was drinking honestly red wine, a half a cup every day, because now it's down to two, two glasses for women. So what about those? <laughs> the, the dietary recommendations or the recommendations for those three substances are so controversial and are under a constant state of flux. Um, you know, almost every year or two, there's a huge study that's published that shows that coffee is good for you or, or it's not as good for you. The same thing with alcohol. We were taught during our training that one glass of wine for women, two a day for men, is great and decreases your mortality from cardiac disease less lower than those people who don't drink. And dark chocolate up and down, off and on. And nowadays it's shown that with alcohol, for instance, yeah, maybe your cardiovascular risks may be lower, but your cancer risks are higher and cancer deaths are higher. So it, it's really controversial and I don't think any of us can look at you and say, this is what you need to do unless we're talking about today, based on today's data, which may change tomorrow. Uh, similar question, except the cholesterol content and egg yolk. And whether or not it's, you know. How much time do you have? <laughs> Benefits and risk, okay. right? <laughs> A lot of controversy on that one, too. Okay. Who's paying for the study? <laughs> Okay, the question is, what about eggs and their cholesterol content? Is that good for you? Is that not? And again, data there are very controversial, especially since the egg issue is more complex because a lot of the studies were sponsored by the egg industry. So we don't know what to believe. So I can't look at you and say, eat three eggs a day. I would not tell you that, <laughs> but um, I, I'd say, yeah, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to reserve my I, opinion. I think that there are probably better things you could be eating in place of eggs that are going to add value to your health and, and hopefully also avoid some of the detrimental effects. Um, some of the byproducts of me egg metabolism are not good for us, and we know that's true. Um, but Dr. Scott is right. Uh, who's paying for the study makes a big difference on the results. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we make a lot of issues, and we hear about it all the time, you know, rehabilitating people with their diets, lose weight, get healthy. How do you handle somebody who's gone through a series of health problems has lost 50 pounds and needs to put weight on? Well, you come see my dietitian named Sherry, and she will help you with that. There are people that actually do need to put on healthy weight. And some of that healthy weight would come through strength training, but also in diet. So it's getting back to some healthy fats. There are, there are healthy fats out there. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's ways that you can put on weight. And I think that it, what we try to do is individualize it to the person. So I would say, I also run the pulmonary rehab program, so I have those issues with pulmonary patients because they're spending so much time breathing, they can't eat, and so that becomes a problem. So your meal wants to be as calorie conscious as possible. You want to get the most calories you can that are healthy the times that you eat. So yeah, it's, that's, it's a tricky one. Most people would, I mean, most people would love to have to gain weight, right? But, but they don't understand the other sides of it, which is sometimes, it's difficult. Um, in place, many places nowadays we see these uh, defib machines lying there, like in the gyms and other places, and it's more and more common. And not everybody may know how to do CPR at home and stuff like that. So for situations where you know, like my parents, they have heart issues, known heart issues, is it uh, now advisable to keep a defib machine at home because if something happens, CPR may not be possible immediately? And like, yes, we got electrophysiologists. We have electrophysiologists here. <laughs>
think CPR is obviously the easiest thing and certainly advocate for everybody. But, you know, defibrillators, um, yeah, I think in high risk places, high risk situations in a gym, <laughs> airports, these places all benefit from that. I mean, I think if you had someone who's predisposed, like we talked about earlier, with some pre existing heart disease, yeah, I think it's very helpful. And nowadays, the defibrillators have their own smarts built in. You, you actually don't have to know much to use it. So let me add to that to keep your, uh, keep your eyes open because we're working on a project for a very inexpensive, very, very small defibrillator about the size of basically uh, two little iPhones that has connectivity. And so I think the defibrillators in five years will be really very widespread. And the uh, most important thing is to know how to use them and when to use them. And so that we'll all need to embrace that part of our education. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We've been on a journey together today. We've learned about the four heart systems. We went through these wonderful panels that connected. How do you guys feel about everything that you learned today and all the wonderful things we were taught? Well, there was, someone, there was someone that wasn't able to be here who's a major component of our team, and that's Dr. Chad Ramahan, who a few have been mentioning. And he uh, really wanted to be here, but he couldn't be, so he recorded a message for us. He's, he's the medical director of our um, cath lab. He's the medical director of the structural heart program and the acute coronary program. He's a very busy doctor. Um, so uh, it's just a few minute uh, message here, let's play it. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Chad Ramahan, and I'm the director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory and Structural Heart Program here at El Camino Health's Norma Malcor Heart and Vascular Institute. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I have the privilege to provide our closing remarks for today's events. I am proud to be part of our collaborative team at HVI, which includes surgeons, clinical nurse specialists, data analysts, and our administrative team all of which are integral to providing excellent patient care. This year, HVI is celebrating 15 years of offering a highly advanced program that delivers exceptional world-class care in a community hospital setting. Over the past 15 years, we've added several offerings and services to HVI. These include the Women's Heart Center, the first of its kind in the Bay Area in a non-academic setting, the Heart Failure Program, Cardio-Oncology, and of course, our Structural Heart Program. Through these programs, we have participated in clinical trials that have allowed our patients access some of the most advanced treatments available in the world. We continue to invest in our community and our services. We've added new state-of-the-art equipment in our cath labs, including a new room to keep pace with the latest available technology. This year, El Camino Health has reached some remarkable milestones, including celebrating over 60 years in this community. During this time, we are proud that our cardiovascular specialists were among the innovative researchers who pioneered heart attack care, transcatheter valve replacement, and transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair with the mitral clip. We've enjoyed having you travel along with us today on the journey to heart wellness. Today, we traverse the path of the patient experiences with acute coronary events such as heart attacks, electrophysiology, the treatment of AFib and other heart arrhythmias, and structural heart interventions, from minimum invasive valve procedures to cardiac surgery. We are proud to evaluate patients in a collaborative team approach across cardiovascular disciplines. The final stop on our patient's cardiac wellness journey is usually cardiac rehabilitation. The cardiac rehabilitation team creates a specialized plan for you. Participating in cardiac rehabilitation can also help to reduce the chance of another cardiac event. Each patient's cardiac rehab plan is a combination of education, exercise, nutrition, and stress management techniques. Thank you for joining us today. We are happy to be your guides on the journey to heart wellness. Um, yeah, so if, if I was uh, gonna get my heart fixed, uh, I'd either go to Conrad if I needed surgery, but if I needed a, stru a structural, uh, there's no one else I think in the world who I'd rather go to than Chad Ramahan, and I'm sorry he wasn't here to, to share his wisdom today. Um, Josh is going to close this up, but I wanted to jump in and, and just say a few words. And first and foremost, I hope all of you feel like you have gained some real 
valuable information for your heart health journey today. So really impressive. And I also, I hope you all have a much better appreciation for the really premier, extraordinary cardiovascular care that we have here at El Camino. I mean, it's an incredible, dedicated team to really providing the very best possible. Um, I would be remiss not to call out a few thanks, first and foremost, to the folks here at Fogarty, Mary Gorman and Ali Gregorian, who offered up the space to us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. I think it's all worked well, and we, we want your feedback on that. Um, feel free, remember, afterwards to go out and wander around a little bit. You can see the tavern devices. You can see the mitral clip. There's some great food. You can wander outside, so no one's going to throw you out soon. Um, you know, the other thing on one of these type of um, productions here is it's wonderful you're all here in person, but we have an extraordinary group of people who are out there online. And so far, as far as I know, it's been totally seamless, totally seamless in terms of how we've been transmitting. So, Bill, thank you very much from Edit One Production. You and all your team have done an extraordinary job. Congratulations. I also have to call out Brian Richards, who is Mr. AV here at El Camino, who's always here whenever we do uh, anything in terms that needs AV. And I also really, really want to call out a thanks to not only all the staff at El Camino, but more importantly, the team at HPI. And the, when I mean the team, it's the whole team. It's the doctors. Thank you so much for donating your time on a Saturday. It's really appreciated. You guys all knocked it out of the park. Really well done. And there's a group of them here. If you have questions, I'm sure they'd be, be willing to, to field them. So it's, it, this, I hope you all feel that this is, has been a worthwhile experience. It's, it's been fun mm -hmm. for me yeah. and hopefully fun for you. And sometimes when things are fun, you, you learn a little more and things stick. So that's good. So on that note, Josh, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to you. You rocked it today. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I can't say much more, but I want to uh, uh, echo um, his uh, gratitude because we had a whole a wonderful team, uh, our event team with Lisa, Janikowski, Samantha, um, and the whole team, uh, the AV team, everyone. Samantha, Samantha yeah. Uh, she, yeah, she, she saved my life this year, uh, basically, with this event. And then uh, all the innovation, and then just want to uh, talk about all the partners that we have, and hopefully you can go visit them. I mean, the, the collaboration between the biotech uh, folks doing all this research and our physicians is so key. And uh, they may even be able to share things that they're working on. I know I'm, they're, we're constantly working on things. So um, you can go do a tavern or you can do a micro clip. They've got all the devices. Yeah, they have all those things there. Yeah, we won't do it today, but uh, good. <laughs> then the other thing, the visuals, uh, this uh, company called MedMovie, they provided those uh, for us uh, uh, free, which was very nice. So I just want to say, and then uh, so you, you don't have to leave. Please stay, get some food, mingle, go see the exhibits, and uh, talk to the doctors. And then um, just a little uh, keepsake for you, because um, our theme was finding your way to heart health. So we got a little commemorative paperweight, but it's a compass. So you got to find your way. Uh -huh. See, it was cute. Uh, Donna, my uh, operations coordinator, came up with that. I thought that's brilliant, and she's normally here for every heart uh, forum, and so we missed Donna. Um, there's, that's another person who couldn't be here today. But anyway, also to the HVI team, if we could do a group shot real quick. So let, if you don't mind letting us get a you know group picture, and then we'll have fun later. Okay, but. Wonderful. Thank you for everyone who attended.